This is uh, the second day of the scheduled sentencing hearing. Ms. Anderson and Ms. Hudson are present for the state at counsel's table. Mr. Beard is present with his client at the defense counsel's table. Uh, his uh, mitigation specialist is also present. Uh, your expert is not sitting behind you. Would you like for me to wait until he arrives? No, Judge, he is uh, in and out of custody. He's only the court for us. It's entirely up to you. Uh, if your client would like me to wait, I surely will. But if you find it to be in your interest to go forward, I will do that. And that's, that's appropriate, Judge. All right, fair enough. Uh, just so that you're aware, as well as before we went on the record, I received four photographs from your he indicated that the state was stipulated to their admissibility. In the photograph? I have, Your Honor. Any objection to their being admitted as defendants' exhibits? No, Your Honor. Based on what Mr. Beard explained that he would be explaining those photographs, I have no objection. They'll be admitted as defendants' exhibits 4, 5, 6, and 7, respectfully, and the mark and tender to the clerk. They'll be used by both sides to the extent they find it in their interest without the necessity of laying any prejudice. Ms. Anderson. Yes, Your Honor, there was an exhibit um, that I had discussed with Mr. Beard yesterday. He is stipulating to it. It is just photographs of Taylor Williams. Mr. Beard, have you reviewed that with your client? Yes, Your Honor, and those are for victim impact, I believe. Yes, So Your Honor. it's also something that we have addressed in the trial or the hearing already. I understand. So uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, Ms. Williams, have you been able to see the photographs that the state intends to use? Okay. Any objections, Mr. Beard? Yes, sir. I'll go ahead and see those as state's exhibit 126. Thank you. And again, the parties will be free to use that to the extent they need. Um, but if it's offered as victim impact, it will not be considered by the court for purposes of sentencing. It's merely the right of the victim to be heard consistent with the statute. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, Judge. I'll look to you, Ms. Anderson. Go ahead and call your witness. Your Honor, the state would call Detective H. Brooks. Detective Brooks, if you come forward and stand before the clerk, raising your right hand to be small. Please take your place on the witness stand. Make yourself as comfortable as you can. There's one right there, too. Okay. Just the microphone. Let me see. When you're ready. Keep your voice up nice and loud so everyone can hear you. Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the court? Harmony Brooks. Detective Brooks, where are you currently employed? Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? 20 years. And where are you currently assigned? Uh, currently assigned to the cold case unit. Prior to the cold case unit, were you also a crime scene detective? Yes, ma'am. For how long? 10 years. In November of 2019, did you and your team become involved in the investigation into a missing child, Taylor Williams? Yes, ma'am. Now, Detective, earlier we watched, yesterday we watched the interview of Brianna Williams. Did you have an opportunity to sit and watch that as it was occurring? Yes, ma'am, I did. After the detectives leave the room, approximately how long is Brianna Williams in that room? Um, she is uh, in that room for approximately 10 hours. At any point, does she knock and ask how the investigation is going? No, ma'am. At any point, does she knock and question if her daughter has been located? No, ma'am. Um, as the defendant is sitting in that room, did the search continue in the city of Jacksonville for Taylor Williams? Yes, ma'am, it did. Approximately how many units were involved in that search? Um, so all patrol, specialized patrol, and um, any available units in the investigative uh, detective division were all dispatched um, to the upwards of um, 100 units. Now, did that search also include other agencies outside of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? Yes, ma'am. What agencies? Um, we had assistance from the FBI, um, St. John's County, um, NCIS, um, JFRD. Um, and potentially uh, others that I probably can't remember right now. Okay. Um, Brianna Williams was interviewed multiple times that day. First, she makes a 911 call, right? Correct. Then she's interviewed on scene by a patrol officer. Correct. Interviewed on scene by a missing persons detective. Correct. And then taken to the police memorial building and interviewed again. Yes, ma'am. Following that day, she was interviewed a couple more times, right? 
Yes, ma'am. Now, we've already heard this investigation led to Alabama. Approximately how many detectives were sent to Alabama to continue the search? Um, so initially, um, approximately uh, 10 to 15 detectives from the homicide unit were sent to Alabama um, to track down uh, her finances and uh, to obtain video surveillance um, from those locations. And after her body was found, were more officers sent? Yes, ma'am. More officers and um, the team from JFRD, uh, the, the recovery team, um, upwards of 75 um, from Duval, with the assistance of apparently a lot more from Alabama. And while that search is going on in Alabama, did detectives here in Jacksonville continue to work around the clock? Yes, ma'am, we did. And were a plethora of search warrants done? Yes, ma'am. For various things like social media, cell site, and the like? Yes, ma'am, all of the above. Did that also include Craigslist? It did. And um, was Craigslist investigated based on the interview of this defendant? That's correct. Detective, I'm going to have you look at your screen. And... Is there anything on your screen at this time, Detective? Um, just the uh, Detective H. Brooks. I'm going to be showing you State's Exhibit 103. These are just some portions of State's Exhibit 103. Does this look familiar to you? Uh, yes, ma'am. That's the um, Craigslist ad that was posted for the movers. I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's on November 3rd. She posts that for the movers. Yes, ma'am. Sunday, November 3rd. All right. And on that same day, is that the ad? Yes, ma'am. That is uh, the actual ad. Now this next portion of that same exhibit, 103, what are we looking at? Um, so it's a, a posting for childcare. Um, it was actually posted November 5th, Tuesday, November 5th. Okay. Aside from that post for childcare, did you see any other posts for childcare in the Craigslist return? No, ma'am. Now did your investigation also include looking into what childcare Taylor had been a part of? Yes, ma'am. What did you find? Uh, we found two local daycares that the child attended. And was one of those kindergarten? Yes, ma'am, two words. Okay, and I'm going to be showing you State's Exhibit 104. Is this the check-in and check-out log from kindergarten? Yes, ma'am. And can you just, for the court's purposes, uh, tell us what date she started there? Uh, it appears she started uh, April 12th, 2018. And what date she ended there? Um, that's going to, um, I don't see it on the screen, but it's April, I believe April 20th uh, in the 20 realm for 2019. Can you see at the bottom here? I'm oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Give me one second. That's okay. I do have the date though. Okay, if you have that date, you can go ahead and tell the court. Um, I believe it's April 26th okay. of 2019. Of 2019. Correct, yes ma'am. Okay. Did you also find um, another daycare that she attended? Yes ma'am, on base. And that's the CDC? Yes ma'am. Yes ma'am, CDC. So I want to talk to you about those records which are State's Exhibit 105. Is this one of those um, pieces of that record? Yes ma'am, it is. And we can see on here emergency contacts. Who are her emergency contacts? Um, the first one listed is a Joriel Sims. Um, she has a relationship to the child as an aunt. Uh, the second one being Wayne Boykin, a relationship to the child being grandfather. And third being Maurice Tate, a relationship to the child being father. So her mother, Carissa Williams, is not listed. She is not. And Carissa Williams is actually who this defendant claims had care of her child. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. But she's not an emergency contact for that child. Correct. I'm um, looking at that same exhibit 105. Uh, what are what's this? This is the the on base CDC um, daycare history. Okay, and we can see that she's pretty consistently going to daycare. At that location, yes, ma'am. So again, on states 105, um, is this where that daycare ends? Yes, ma'am. So it starts um, on for for this year, uh, the year uh, in question of 2019, um, 1 11 2019 through. Uh, April 29th, 2019. Is there a dip in attendance between those months? Uh, yes, ma'am. There is there is no attendance in March. In March, okay. 
Um, and then her attendance ends completely on April 29th. Yes, ma'am. Did you guys find any other daycare facilities that, the, that Taylor had attended? No, ma'am. Were records also obtained regarding Taylor's medical care? It was. And can you explain to the court what the last dated medical care was? Um, to my recollection, she had a speech appointment and attended it on April 3rd. Now, the court has already heard testimony regarding the defendant's work schedule and her hours. During your investigation, did you also find a very detailed planner? Yes, ma'am, we did. Can you explain to the court what kind of details in that planner? Um, extremely detailed, extremely or, um, organized. Um, it gave her uh, daily activities um, down to uh, what she was doing at work, uh, whether she was going to the movies, um, where she was working, um, and set appointments. Okay. In that planner, aside from her Navy duties, did you also find other, um, maybe like volunteer positions that she had written in there? Yes, ma'am. And would those have extended beyond the hours of her normal working hours? They were, yes, ma'am. The majority of them were night jobs or weekend. Um, at some point, does that planner just stop talking about Taylor? Yes, ma'am. Were the defendant's financial records also obtained? They were. Were those records um, cataloged and analyzed to see uh, specifically food purchases? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to the court what you all found as it relates to food purchases? Um, so our, fina <clears throat> our financials went back through um, uh, April and March, but um, I started in March um, on uh, specifically food financials. Uh, <clears throat> and um, for example, in March, there were uh, 12 trips to McDonald's. Um, April, there were nine trips to McDonald's. Uh, May, 18 trips uh, to McDonald's. Um, to end in um, October with six trips to McDonald's. And if my recollection is correct, in March, we're talking about $300, $300 total being spent on food for the entire month. Yes, ma'am. I broke it down. Um, McDonald's seemed to be the, the frequent um, choice, um, so that's why I separated it. Um, the other food um, amount for March was $187. Um, the, um, the other food amount for uh, October was $135. Okay, so a pretty significant dip. Uh, yes, ma'am. For McDonald's, it was. And um, does the fast food just completely stop at some point in October? Um, after October 13th, there are no fast food purchases. Of what year? This year, uh, 2019, sir. Did you also find some movie purchases that were noteworthy? Yes, ma'am. Was that through Fandango? It was. And were the records obtained from Fandango? Yes, ma'am. Detective, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 125. Is that the record? It is. And can you just explain to the court what we're looking at? Um, so at the top is the purchase date of November 1st, 2019. Um, it was refunded that same day. Um, the movie in attendance was going to be Arctic Dogs on November 5th. Um, again, refunded uh, that, that same day. And this is a children's movie? It is, yes, ma'am. Um, still on that same exhibit, what is it we're looking at here? Um, so, again, so she purchases it on the 1st, refunds it on the 1st, repurchases the same tickets um, on the 5th of November 2019 for a um, movie day four days away on November 9th, 2019. And to be clear, November 5th is the day before she reports Taylor Miller. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm showing you another page of that same exhibit, and I want to draw your attention to this 10-1 purchase here. Um, what is that movie that she's purchased a ticket for? Um, yes, ma'am. So 10-1-2019, she purchased a ticket to The Joker um, to be attended at 7.45 p.m. And that's one ticket? One ticket, yes, ma'am. And 7.45 at night? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was that purchase refunded? No, ma'am. Now, we've heard testimony that the defendant had two places that she was renting. Um, was she paying rent for both of those locations? Yes, ma'am, she was. Was she paying JEA for both of those locations? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, during your investigation, did you obtain an inspection photo from 
the 8787 Southside Boulevard. Yes, ma'am, we did. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 106. Is that that inspection photograph? Yes, ma'am, it is. And what is the date on that inspection photograph? June 25th, 2019. Uh, detective, during your investigation into the financials, did you find an IHOP purchase? Yes, ma'am. How many? Just one. On what date? October 5th, 2019. And October 5th was a Saturday, right? I do not know. I'm going to okay. go with your word on that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, during your investigation, did you attempt to piece together a timeline after getting that 911 call? Yes, ma'am, we did. Did that include getting cell site data? Yes, ma'am. Actually, before we go into that, I'm going to show you one additional. We've already talked about it with um, some members of the Navy, but did you also obtain that lead form from the Navy? Yes, ma'am, we did. All right, and that states Exhibit 102. Is that what we're looking at here? Correct. The date that she requested leave is October 22nd of 2019. Yes, ma'am. And the leave is for October 31st to November 5th of 2019. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And who does that number belong to? Brianna Williams. What date range was cell site data requested for? Um, April 2019 through November 2019. Why April of 2019? Um, as previously uh, discussed, uh, that is when Taylor um, is no longer um, going to daycare and her medical uh, appointments are, are missed. And was that cell site data then mapped? Mapped, yes, ma'am. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 98. Um, what is this map depicting? So this is the time frame, um, as we just discussed, April um, 2019 um, to, uh, to the end of October, uh, beginning of November 2019. Um, it's the, uh, the state of Florida, um, and it proves that she did not leave the state of Florida in that time frame. And that time frame is April 1st to October 30th? Yes. She stays within Florida? Yes, ma'am. Now we can see she leaves Jacksonville. Correct. Um, I'm showing you the next map, which is state 99. Um, what is this map depicting? So this is, um, there were three trips total um, to Alabama um, in three days, uh, beginning October 31st. Um, this is the first trip. Okay, so she travels from Jacksonville, Florida through Georgia into Alabama and back. Yes, ma'am. And that trip starts at 7, 10 a.m. and ends at 12, 28 a.m. Yes, ma'am. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 100. What is this depicting? Uh, this is trip two, um, beginning November 1st um, and ending November 2nd. Um, it's leaving Jacksonville um, and again, on, on this trip, um, going west through Jacksonville first, then up through Atlanta and back to Jacksonville. Okay. And then the final trip, um, which is State's Exhibit 101, what is this depicting? Um, this is the third trip, um, November 2nd um, through uh, November 3rd. Okay. And again, she's traveling from Jacksonville, Florida, and we can see that she goes to Demopolis at this point and then back to Jacksonville, Florida. Yes, ma'am. Detective, was this cell site data used to kind of narrow the scope of the search in Alabama? Yes, ma'am. Was there also what is called a Burla downloaded? Yes, ma'am. All right, and Burla relates to the defendant's vehicle. Correct. And the, the court has already heard a little bit of testimony about an infotainment center that gets GPS data. Correct. So using that GPS data, were you all able to pinpoint the exact point that she went to Lance Hill Road? Yes, ma'am. And was that on strip three? Yes, ma'am. Did the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office then work to kind of retrace her steps? 
Yes, ma'am. Was surveillance obtained in retracing those steps? It was. Uh, approximately how many businesses was surveillance collected from? Um, in reference to financial um, data obtained, uh, approximately eight businesses. And in how many states? Three. So these, these surveillance videos range from October 31st to November 3rd, correct? Correct. Yes, ma'am, correct. At any point in these videos do we see Taylor Williams? We do not. At any point in these videos do we see the defendant doing anything that would indicate that she is with a child? No, ma'am, she appears solo. Okay, can you explain that a little bit further to the court? Um, on the majority of them, um, she is just getting out and getting gas. Um, there's no efforts to open any other car doors. Um, to let you know a five-year-old out to walk, use the restroom, eat, um, nothing along those lines. Um, it's it's just a defendant. Okay. Um, the court has already heard testimony from Captain Roberts about uh, a clay embankment that was hit by the vehicle. Was that that information relayed back to y'all? Yes, ma'am. And did you go back to Brianna Williams' car to see if there was any evidence of her hitting that embankment? Yes, ma'am. Detective, I'm going to show you Exhibit 27. Um, what are we looking at here? Um, this is the uh, defendant's Honda, the front right quarter panel, um, and appears to have damage to it. And State 28, is that that red dirt up underneath that safe side? Um, it is red dirt uh, underneath the wheel well, yes ma'am. And State 29? Same. Now, during the investigation, um, was the defendant's cell phone downloaded? Yes, ma'am. And was that data analyzed as well? It was. To include text messages? Yes, ma'am. Again, trying to piece together a timeline because the information you had, you found to be false. Correct. I want to talk to you about some text messages specifically between this defendant and her mother, Carissa Williams. So this is going to be State's Exhibit 118. These messages begin September 7th of 2019, correct? Yes, ma'am. And they begin with, on line four, is this a message from Carissa Williams? It is. And she's asking how Taylor is. Correct. The rest of these messages on that date, what did the two of them spend time discussing? Uh, men. Men? Okay. I'm showing you another slide. Um, actually, let me back up. Sorry. On line five, what is Brianna Williams' response when Carissa Williams asks her how Taylor is? She seems to think she can have anything she wants if she asks for it. And then from there, the conversation is just about men. Correct. Um, States Exhibit 118, um, is this them talking about men? Yes, ma'am, correct. They're talking about searching men on the internet? Online, yes, ma'am. Another um, portion of that exhibit, talking about OkCupid? Okay correct. And that's a dating site? It is. Okay. Um, on that same exhibit, we can see on 9-7 at 5-10, and there's this use of DuckDuckGo, which the court has already heard about. Correct, yes ma'am. And that's a search engine to keep your stuff private. Correct. These are more messages between the two of them. And I'm sorry, I misspoke. This is Exhibit 120, I apologize to the court. This is Exhibit 120. Um, Again, we have more messages and uh, specifically a phone call on October 31st of 2019 when this defendant is supposedly going to pick up Taylor, right? Yes, ma'am. And she calls her mom? Correct. And has a 28-minute conversation? Yes, ma'am. Can you read to the court line 171, who it's from, who it's to, and what it says? Um, it is from Brianna uh, to Carissa. We're headed back to hot Jacksonville. We should be back for Thanksgiving. If you do get on the road this weekend, be safe. Okay. During the investigation, did someone from your team speak directly with Carissa Williams? Carissa Williams, yes ma'am. Okay, 
And did she relate to you anything about a conversation, a phone conversation she had with Brianna Williams? Yes, ma'am. What did she say? Um, she explained that Brianna asked her, her being Carissa, that if the Navy command was to call, um, Carissa had Taylor. Did you also obtain messages between, uh, from, sorry, excuse me. Did you obtain messages from Brianna Williams on Tonisha Williams' phone? Yes. And Tonisha Williams is who to Brianna Williams? Her sister. Uh, this is part of State's Exhibit 121. Can you just read these messages? Uh, yes, ma'am. So the green boxes are the sister, uh, the first being, uh, you not coming home anytime soon, question mark. Uh, the second message be, being, how have you guys been? How's Tay Bear? Uh, the response from Brianna, thinking about it, but every time I've planned, something has come up. And then that, con that continues to the next page? Yes, ma'am. Um, again from Brianna, uh, Taylor is a nightmare. I don't know where she's getting this, in quotes, hide food and trash under her bed end quote idea from but it's aggravating at one point she had a whole picnic under her bed bread chips turkey and cheese um, Does, so, do the messages go on to say that this is just a phase telling Brianna not to worry that was the sister's response yes that was a, that it, this was a phase okay um and that conversation continues i want you to specifically read this message i'm circling here on 625 at 902 a.m Yes, ma'am. Brianna uh, responding. And here I am trying to be nice. I stop and get us breakfast. She's opening my cases of bottled water in the back seat while I'm driving to the park. I am at a loss. Now, Detective, this message is important because what else happens on 625, 2019? That's the day um, that the apartment complex went to her apartment and took the um, photographs um, for their spot inspection, if you will. Were messages also obtained between this defendant and her friend, Doriel Sims? Yes, ma'am. And this is State's Exhibit 123. Um, can you just tell us what this message is and the date? Um, it's a photograph of Taylor um, in a tiger costume um, on 10-31-2019. And is that that photograph that's attached to that message? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Part of that same exhibit, um, which is states 123, we again have some messages. It starts on 11-2-2019 at 1225 a.m. We can see there's another picture attached here, right? Yes, ma'am. Is that that picture? It is. And this is presumably Brianna Williams here? Correct. And what is this? I honestly, I believe it's a, a car seat with um, dolls in it or stuffed animals. So Doriel Sims responds to that with, where are y'all going? What does Brianna Williams say? Uh, all over, LOL, you know she loves to ride. And Doriel Sims responds with, but you won't come here. Correct. Um, continuing on 11-5-2019, so the day before she reports Taylor Williams missing, what does she say to Dory Sims? Uh, the first message? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's sad I have to pull out my gun before going in the house, isn't it? And then um, Dory responds, and then what does Brianna Williams then say on line 143? I was supposed to talk to legal slash a lawyer Monday. But their system was down. They called today and told me to come in tomorrow at 1130. Well, yesterday slash today. And this is about breaking that lease at Ivy Street? Yes, that's correct. Detective, during your investigation, did you find that the defendant was talking to multiple men at one time? Yes, ma'am. And this was supported by the text messages? Correct. As well as interviewing these men? Yes. Okay. The first... Um, group of messages I want to talk about is Dalton Roberts, and this is State's Exhibit 124. Um, I want to draw your attention
attention to line 166. Can you tell me the date and time of this? September 30th, 2019, 6.53 p.m. All right, and prior to this, they're talking about her coming to see him at work, right? Correct. And she's saying to him, here, I think. Correct. As in, I've arrived. Correct. And this is after her working hours. Correct. And then line 168, he sends her a message at 7.46 p.m. that says, thanks for coming. Correct. You made my day. All right, on um, the next slide, which is still part of the State's Exhibit 124, um, on 10-1-2019 at 8.34 p.m., Brianna Williams sent a message to him saying what? Safe for me to be on my way, question mark. And he replied yes. Yes. And then we have a gap in messages until this bottom one, line 211, what is the date and time of that message? 11, 11 p.m. Um, and she replies that she is now home. Okay. Detective, did you find any messages on 10-1 going all the way to 11 p.m. that Taylor had passed there? No, ma'am. Did you ever find any messages on her phone where she was setting up past there? No, ma'am. On 10-5, again, a message between she and Dalton Roberts, State's Exhibit 124. Um, what, is, what does this message say? Um, you're making this hard. I have to know dates so I can make arrangements for Taylor. Okay, and again, Detective, did you find anywhere in her phone where she was making arrangements for Taylor? No, ma'am. And this date is 10-5? Correct. Um, Detective, in those messages, on 11-2-2019, do you see where she's talking about the damage to her car? She is. Okay. Um, does she actually send a picture? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is that her car with the damage? It is. And she's communicating that to Dalton Roberts? Correct. And we can actually see on the tire here, it looks like right here. Correct. Consistent with landfill road. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's another group of messages between another man, Fred Baker, and this is State's Exhibit 122. Uh, this first set of messages on 9-6-2019, can you read that first one for us? LOL, I can't go to Tampa at the drop of a dime right now. And is Brianna sending that message? Yes. Um, and then jump to line 340. Uh, who is that message from and what does it say? Um, from Mr. Baker um, on 9-6. Why not? Not like you have a daughter here. And then line 342. Who is that message from and what does it say? Um, it's from Brianna uh, responding to Mr. Baker. She is now. I'm sorry, say that again. She is now. And this is September 6th. Okay, then I'm jumping to messages between the two of them on 9-15-2019, still part of that same exhibit, 122. Um, what does that top message say, and what time is it sent? Uh, September 15th, 2019, 10.52 p.m. It's nearly 11, and you're still up. And that's from Fred Baker? Yes. And she responds, I had something to take care of. She did? And then jumping to that bottom line, 771, who is that message from? What time is it? What does it say? Um, it is from uh, Brianna, again, to Mr. Baker, um, the same date, the 15th, 1054 p.m., so two minutes later. I pulled up at my home now, though. Detective, did you find any child care messages on that date? No, ma'am. Okay, jumping to some more messages on October 15th of 2019. Um, tell me this top line, which is 2711. Uh, October 15th, uh, 6.39 p.m. 
just made it to Fort Pierce. And that's from Brianna Williams? Correct. Where's Fort Pierce? Uh, South Florida. Uh, the last line, can you read that one for me? Um, I LMAO, I had to take my midterm. And that's from Brianna? Correct. All right, jumping to some messages on 10 20 of 2019, still between she and Fred Baker. Um, it's some talk about changing out car seats, right? Yes, ma'am. And she's complaining because Taylor has peed in the car seat. Correct. Can you read lines 2856 for us? Uh, 10 20, 108 p.m. Ha ha ha, your daughter is here with you now. Nice. What does Brianna respond? She's usually always here, LOL. And what does he say back? Uh, LOL, every time I ask, she is in Alabama. And this is October 20th of 2019. Yes, ma'am. Uh, these messages, again, between she and Fred Baker on October 27th of 2019, is she talking about needing help to move? She is. And he makes a suggestion to her at line 3081, right? Correct. What does he tell her? I would ask people from the command to help. What does she respond? But then they know where I stay. These messages again between her and Fred Baker on 11-5-2019, so the night before she reports her child missing. Um, can you tell me what line 3408 says? Um, again, 11-5, um, 2019, 3.46 p.m. Legal, finally called. I have an appointment tomorrow. What does he respond? Wow, running the streets late with a daughter at home. And Detective, this last line here, um, 3, 3412, she talks about loaded Loading Kelly, is that a reference to one of her guns? Um, I believe so, yes. She does a lot of talking about her guns, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, detective, there was some testimony yesterday from Detective Ostertag about some computer searches that were done. And I want to talk to you specifically about a couple of those. On here we can see it is the very first article that is clicked on. Did you click on that article? I did. Can you tell us what that article is about? Um, so September 12th, 2019, um, in Ohio, Cheerleader uh, found not guilty of murdering her, her newborn baby. She buried the baby in the backyard? Correct. And she was found not guilty of fraud? Correct. There's more searches of, or more articles clicked on of, about children dying, right? Yes, ma'am. And then there's this search on DuckDuckGo for re-feeding syndrome. Did you go to that website? Yes, ma'am. Can you summarize for the court what that um, so my understanding is uh, the refeeding syndrome is a form of starvation or fasting that dramatically um, affects your electrolytes, hormones, and then if you uh, start to put food back into your, your system, um, it has to be monitored or um, you have too much insulin and it can be fatal. And then on that same exhibit, which is States 119, uh, there's, there's talk of malnourished children. Correct. And on the same exhibit, there's also some articles read about a three-year-old who went missing in Alabama. Yes. Did that happen around the same time that she reported Taylor missing? Um, I believe, if not in September, October um, in Alabama. Um, Detective, <clears throat> Dr. Heather Walsh Haney came out to Alabama to assist in the collection of Taylor, Will Ta Taylor Williams' remains, correct? Yes, ma'am. And unfortunately, she can't join us here today. So I want you to assist the court in understanding
in the exhibit that he received, um, which is her report. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Walsh Haney analyzed the bones that were found, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that included specifically two things that she found some indication that she could make a finding on. The dental and then the oral side, correct? Correct. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you first about the dental. So we have a picture here, and this is all coming from State's Exhibit. One of seven. I have it, it's the report of osteological exam. Yes, sir. Um, in this report, she talks about linear enamel hypoplasia. Yes, ma'am. And that's something she observed on the teeth. Correct. And that's something she's indicating here in her photograph. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, and she describes linear enamel hypoplasia as a disruption of enamel formation during growth that has been linked to three things. Correct. Disease. Disease, trauma, and um, nutritional deficiencies. She then talks about this other picture to the left here, which is the right orbital, right? Correct. And she describes that what she observed there is called cribra orbitalia. Yes. And cribra orbitalia also can develop from three separate things. What are those? Disease, trauma, and nutritional deficiencies. Now, the detective, unfortunately, only about 10% of Taylor's bones were found, right? Correct. And a lot of them had significant animal damage. Yes, ma'am. So that was as far as we could go with those bones. Yes, ma'am. Because this defendant left her decaying body on the side of the road. Yes, ma'am. May I have one moment? Yes. No more questions for this witness, Your Honors. Mr. Beard. Morning. I'm showing you a PowerPoint that she was looking at, and I don't know the exhibit number, but it is in regards to the children's movie records. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, what's the second to last date that she was in the exhibit? Uh, April 17th, 2019. April 17th, 2019. Correct. What time did she arrive? Uh, 7.44 a.m. So that would definitely be before 9 o'clock in the morning. Yes, sir. And so she was there until what time that day? 1.21 p.m. Okay. So. Um, on that date that she is checked into daycare. Okay. Now, Fred Baker, we talked to you about the, the phone records. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, isn't it true that Fred Baker was a coworker in the movie? Um, I do not know their relationship, sir. Okay. Um, did you ever talk to Fred Baker? I did not personally, no, sir. So you have no idea as to what the feelings or emotions or why this man was checked? No, sir. All right. So your interpretation of what those checks mean are based on your just reading of the checklist? That's correct. Okay. And you didn't talk to Ms. Williams about those entries either? No, sir. When she's indicating that she's home, like there was one message that said, I pulled up at my house home. Is that 
Um, not that I know of, sir. Um, the cell site data would have confirmed it, but we just went by the text that when she said she was home, she was home. All right, but did you go in trying to pull cell site data for that? Um, not that specific date, no, sir. All right, but um, the other text messages about Taylor being in town are being viewed as untruthful. For Taylor to be in town? Yes, that she's with her daughter, that she's always with in, that, in the conversation with Fred Baker? It depends on the date you're referring to. Okay. But it's possible that the majority of those text messages aren't true. That's possible. But there's no indication as to which ones are true and which ones aren't. From just a text message? No, sir. You had talked about you looked at her detailed planner, and that was a paper planner that she was writing in for a yearly calendar. Correct. And you said it stopped talking about Taylor. Yes, sir. When did that happen? Um, best recollection I have is summer. There was no appointments or anything that were noted in the planner later on that, that year? Um, I believe the appointments were noted, um, but uh, like for example, a flu shot um, for Taylor was in the planner, um, but it continued to make its way to each month, so the flu shot was never given. So what do you mean by it stopped talking about Mr. Taylor that continued on? Well, the, the medical appointments um, were in the planner, and then there was none after April, um, to my recollection. Did she meet all of her other obligations in the planner? Um, that I do not know. So the information in the planner could be true, it might not have happened. Correct, it could have just been a, I, I want to do these things. Okay, uh, and then you said that you were looking at financial records and there was a bunch of fast food purchases? Correct. Do you recall any pizza hut purchases? Um, I can look, I, I know there was one in November, um, towards the end of October, um, beginning of November. I don't recall any before that. Were there multiple credit cards that were searched? Yes, sir. Um, what about use of cash? Um, they are, there are cash, cash withdrawals on her account. Yes, sir. Um, are you able to say where that money was spent? No, sir. The records that you obtained, when we're talking about financial, we're not just talking about one credit card. We're talking about every financial institution credit card, bank account, anything like that. Correct. Um, and that was from the Amber Alert that was started in the National Emergency? From the, say that again, sir, sorry? The Amber Alert that was issued in the National Emergency? Yes, sir. And so the federal government was able to assist in getting everything that, that they wanted? Yes, sir. And so when we're talking about records, I mean, it is essentially everything that she could have searched email addresses. Yes, sir. Um, email addresses that led to email addresses. Yes, sir. Bank accounts that led to services that she had. Correct. So when I'm saying services, I'm talking about like Match.com. Correct. And then you know, Yes. Um, essentially a whole picture of her financial and social history. Correct. There was also surveillance videos that were obtained numerous locations based on those financial records. Yes, sir. In all of that review, is it fair to say that the first time that Ms. Williams disclosed that Taylor was not with her would have been on the nine one one? From financial data to a 911 call? You said that you had a chance to process all of this, review all of this throughout the team. Correct. Um, and what I'm asking is, did she tell anybody about Taylor missing, that there was an injury, that there was a problem, anybody until she called 911? 
not to my knowledge, no, sir. So the first disclosure of anything that they listed is not in the Yes, sir. basis for argument. Um, it's not an arguable point because it's not a piece of evidence that the court can consider for purposes of fashioning a sentence. Yes, sir. Go ahead, counsel.
seen the photographs and the videos. Jackson, do you have any additional evidence to witness what the court considers? Mr. Beard, do you need any recess before we move to your presentation to the extent you're going to offer one? Yes, sir. I'm going to ask for 15 minutes to the possible. Uh, we've been at this for now uh, an hour and approximately five minutes for the benefit of everyone to allow the defense to uh, prepare. Uh, we'll be recessed for five minutes. Five minutes, everyone. Thank you.
don't rush Mr. Beard in any way, but just let him know that whenever he's ready, we're ready. Yes, Sean. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Media, please confirm that the sound is off. I've just been told that the live feed is actually playing the conversation in Portland. I have the color bars up so that the feed isn't interrupted for the other stations. Um, what does that mean to a layman? It means that visual isn't going on. Oh, but if this is on, is the audio still? Yes. Oh. Let's go ahead and go back on the record. We're here in the matter of State versus Williams. As Williams has returned to the courtroom, um, I'll ask Officer Beale to go ahead and assist her with her handcuffs. Counsel for State is present. Counsel for Defendant is present, along with his expert and support staff. Let me look to you. How do you present and get a 10 proceed? Step forward and stand before the clerk, raising your right hand. Sure, you 
please take your place on the witness stand. Make yourself comfortable. Take the time to unpack what you are offered. So okay. And there's water. In it. Oh, gotcha. beautiful. Okay, thank you. Ernest J. Bordini, Ph.D. And what do you currently do? I am a uh, licensed psychologist, specialty in clinical and forensic neuropsychology. And um, you have to get some education to be able to have that title? Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, studies at Boston College, uh, the uh, bachelor's in psychology, uh, graduated scholar of the college, Came here to graduate school in 1979 at the University of Florida in the Department of Clinical and Health Psychology. I earned both a master's and a PhD in clinical and health psychology and a minor in neuropsychology. Did my uh, internship at the VA Medical Center, did rotations in neuropsychology. I actually created a rotation in forensic psychology for myself during that time. Uh, alcohol, substance abuse, and just general mental health. And I did postgraduate uh, uh, st uh, studies with uh, behavioral health associates, did a lot of work in a child psychiatric hospital during that period of time, got licensed. And, and so when did you become, uh, uh, when did you get licensed? Licensed in 1989. And so you've been practicing since 1989? Yes. I've, I've testified in uh, federal courts in Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee. I think I've testified in most uh, districts in the state of Florida. And have you always testified for the defense or have you testified for a variety of reasons? I do both civil and criminal, so the definitions differ, but in terms of criminal cases, I've uh, testified uh, for the defense, for the state, and at times I've been court appointed. Yes. And do you continue to stay abreast of the uh, new changes in the field? I try to. Uh, you want to assume that there's still quite there? Okay. No questions. All right. Thank you. Now, uh, I contacted you to assist in this case, and uh, could you just talk about the uh, initial timing? I don't know exactly when, but I was contacted earlier in the year uh, about the, the current case. Uh, we scheduled some initial uh, dates to start the evaluation. Unfortunately, my wife came back from vacation with COVID and uh, I got it from her and it postponed things for about a month. So the actual evaluations didn't start till July um, of this year. Uh, in the meantime, I had quite a few records to review, um, videotapes, uh, medical records of Taylor, uh, Navy records uh, from Ms. Williams, um, investigation reports, photographs, uh, um, witness statements, and, and, and so forth. And that's all contained in your report summary that we have marked as an exhibit into this court. So I, I'll spare you going through all the details, but uh, the court's records, all those items. The procedures that you administered as well were contained in that summary, um, which we'll talk about during the testimony, but is it accurate, the summary that you provided of all this? I believe it is. Okay. Uh, how much time did you actually get to spend with Ms. Williams? Um, 
I spent three full days, which would mostly be nine to five. There was one day where she wasn't brought back after a break at, at the jail, so that one probably ended a little early, around three. Well, she left at 3.30. We waited until about 4.30 for her to come back and ask the guards a few times. and. Uh, then look, anyhow, it, it didn't work out. And then there was another half day, so it was uh, three and a half days, more or less, of time with her. And uh, what were your initial impressions? Um, my initial impressions was uh, uh, she, she had a, um, it, it was striking in that when I saw her initially, she was very demure, extremely soft-spoken, uh, kind of talking almost in a whisper, very poor eye contact in terms of tending to look down. Uh, communication was kind of slow to establish. She would tend to uh, shake her head in a very stereotypic kind of way when it wasn't something she wanted to talk about or whether it was something that she wanted to say no to. Um, and she also had a very characteristic giggle that would occur across the evaluation. Her affect was generally flat, um, and then you'd have these giggles. Sometimes she would settle down and have a little bit more of a normal response to a little bit of humor or response. Uh, when we talked about Taylor, uh, she clearly emotionally change so she would be a lot more anxious, a little bit more depressed. Um, the giggle stuff kind of stopped. Uh, she looked a lot more serious, sad. So there were these affective changes that clearly made her seem very odd. Uh, so some of my original, you know, my initial impressions aside from what I had, uh, you know, in terms of the history, was I was really wondering whether she had a bit of a, a schizoaffective disorder. Uh, I eventually didn't feel like she met the full criteria for that, but certainly some schizoid, schizoaffective stuff, just from the initial interaction was like added to my list of things to try to, you know, figure out as I was going through the diagnostic process. And just to slow on that, what, what is the schizoaffective? Um, Schizoaffective disorder is, is sort of a combination of uh, symptoms of schizophrenia and mood disorders affect. Typically people have odd, unusual affect. It's usually present across situations and, and different things like that. Clearly she could fly into a different role when she, you know, in terms of her military role and stuff like that. So it seemed inconsistent with some of the leadership qualities and other things that were reflected in her uh, military record. Um, and so since it wasn't really present across a lot of situations, um, you know, I, I, I didn't uh, feel like she would meet full criteria. Uh, but I think she was, you know, someone who had a bit of a fragment of personality that, you know, she could put on a particular role and present in a certain way and that underneath it, there was a lot of trauma and, and, and other schizoidish and, and uh, more significant psych pathology. And so did that impression ultimately change or did you have a final opinion that we could talk about versus going through the individual steps? Well, you know, my process is to try to not come to any conclusions until I actually finish the, the final summary and report. Uh, Basically, if you start to make conclusions too early, you stop looking and you start finding what you want to look for. So uh, I, I went through a process, and the process involves gathering history, you know, kind of reviewing my clinical observations and intuition, uh, looking at the test results and seeing what fits there. Um, I, I felt, I, you know, I, I felt there was a lot I didn't get from the interviews. The mitigation interviews helped. She seemed to open up a lot more about uh, childhood traumas and some of the sexual issues, uh, which is not surprising since some strange man coming in and asking her about that. Um, but re what really struck me is when I started looking at the psychological test results, it really confirmed for me that there was a lot more underneath the surface. There was quite a wide range of psychopathology 
um, that I eventually settled on in terms of final diagnostic impressions. I, I certainly considered antisocial personality disorders, paranoid personality disorders, schizoid personality disorder, uh, avoidant personality disorder. Again, because her functioning wasn't consistent across a lot of different settings, it was variability to it, that largely precludes the personality disorder diagnosis. And in terms of the antisocial personality di disorder, she acknowledged some antisocial behaviors, but really didn't have any social attitudes, and again, wasn't a true across things, and she certainly doesn't have a long criminal history uh, that would qualify for that, or severe conduct problems as a child. So it kind of settled in terms of the personality dynamics on schizoid, um, paranoid, and avoidant personality features, which she's got some, that's part of her makeup. Um, it's not um, fully a DSM diagnosis of paranoid uh, or, or uh, personality disorders. In terms of uh, looking at things, we think about, you know, affective disorders and anxiety disorders. And one of the things that, you know, early on in the interview, um, and she'd gone through this material a couple of times because the mitigation specialist had helped her with the history forms because she has real serious visual impairments. As you can see in the courtroom, she's got her head really close to the thing, uh, to her papers. Uh, that's because she can't see very well. Uh, the mitigation uh, specialist helped her uh, complete both history forms uh, regarding herself and on Taylor. Uh, I had her fill out a, t uh, a history form on Taylor because part of what I'm trying to understand is any of Taylor's dynamics or characteristics which make, would have made her prone to being abused or, and also to try to understand the relationship that uh, uh, Brianna had with uh, Taylor. Um, and so we went through both of those and, and clearly from early on, it was really clear that she had some early childhood traumas, uh, some of them were sexual in nature by various parental figures. Uh, she was suicidal uh, at a pretty young age, had pretty clear and vivid recalls of wanting to kill herself with a gun that was kept on top of the refrigerator, uh, remembering that people were dying around that time. Uh, and some minor self-harm behavior, such as cutting on herself. Most of that cleared by age 15. Um, but there's some other incidents that are suspicious in terms of uh, an overdose with uh, uh, some over-the-counter uh, uh, products, which I, I don't know if she thought she had a cough or something, uh, a car an accidental carbon monoxide poisoning, which sounds like she didn't lose consciousness, but in uh, someone who has a suicidal history, those things kind of uh, certainly perk the ears in terms of clinical significance. Um, and when I kind of went into more depth about her depressive symptoms, she clearly described uh, a pretty long history since childhood of having both some eating issues and going on radical diets, not having a very good self-concept, poor body image, but also more uh, other symptoms such as withdrawing and, uh, uh, you know, being less motivated and, and, and having what we consider symptoms of major depressive disorders tended to occur more in uh, the winter, which would be a seasonal pattern. Uh, she would come out of those. Uh, she'd kind of continue working her school stuff. She actually succeeded in school and during one particular trauma after she was raped and uh, had an abortion. Uh, it sounds like she had another one of these major depressive episodes and indicated, you know, she didn't eat for a period of time and the way that she kind of got through it was largely focusing on her studies, just, you know, distracting herself. Ultimately, that led to a diagnosis of what some people refer to as a double depression uh, in the old days, dysthymic disorder uh, referred to sort of neurotic depression or people who had chronically low self-esteem and so forth. That responds not very well to medication. That's usually psychotherapy and years of work to try to change your self-concept. But superimposed on that was a recurrent major depressive disorder. 
Um, so in today's nomenclature, we'd call that persistent depressive disorder, I'm, uh, early onset with major recurrent episodes, which were severe, and you know, so has an anxiety feature. So there's a long uh, nomenclature for that. She had childhood fears um, and anxieties, as most people who have adult anxiety disorders have that in childhood, uh, as well as a sense of paranoia from an early age. Um, some of that seemed to escalate over time, so I ultimately ended up with a depersonalization and derealization disorder, uh, a social anxiety disorder. She was very self-conscious, always worried about what other people would think very shy about talking in front of other people. Some of that anxiety you could see in the nervous giggles and stuff like that and her shaking of the heads. So it was just has, has some difficulty uh, when maybe not in role uh, doing some of those things. And as time went on, she seemed, sounds like she had some panic disorder uh, dating back to maybe Virginia where a friend of hers kind of suspected she may have had a nervous breakdown because she went to the emergency room uh, her explanation of that was she was having some uh, GI symptoms um, and may have taken too much uh, uh, medication for that or she was having heartburn, which can bother you in the chest. Uh, but in my experience, uh, when you show up at the ER with intense chest pain and it's not cardiac, a lot of times it's like an early panic disorder or panic attack because those are the classic symptoms of that. And so through those diagnoses that you were talking about, you were relying on uh, information that you learned from records, from interviews, and meetings with Ms. Wilson. Is that right? Yes, it's, it's, it's a compilation and distillation the process of following hunches and seeing if there's collaboration in the records and the testing and, and interview and observations uh, that would lead to those conclusions, correct? And if you could speak to Yeah, fair enough. Um, clearly at times when I was interviewing her, um, there were things that are psychologically important. You know, I, I, I have a habit of asking people about their, ta their tattoos. Uh, a lot of times when they don't want to talk about other things, sometimes I can get them to open up a little bit as, as to when they got the tattoo and what they meant uh, to them. Um, she had little insight into her first couple of tattoos. There was like a heart with snakes or whatever it is, and it was rather, you know, superficial, didn't get anywhere, uh, feel it was a little bit disconnected. At other times when I talked about things that were much more serious, like, you know, given the fact that she had this history of uh, her aunt's husband um, sexually propositioning her, asking her, has she ever had an orgasm? Can we be alone? History of being raped. And I'm kind of questioning her about getting into BDSM and, and dating, you know, some uh, questionable, kind of risky situations, I would suspect, as well as uh, her original boyfriend who was described as a drug dealer and looked at her as like, you know, you, you see any connections between you know, your fascination with this and the trauma and the history and, and you would think you would be afraid of this. And boy, she just could not make the connection. She just kind of, uh, it seemed disconnected and, and it, it kind of added to my impressions that there were some dissociative uh, kind of features to her spinning off parts of reality and, and just becoming overwhelmed by the emotional conflicts and just compartmentalizing them which we see a lot of times in people who have histories of trauma. Uh, depersonalization, derealization kind of phenomena are, are not uncommon for people who have PTSD, which I didn't think she meant full criteria for, but she did have some trauma history and features, uh, which I also ended up diagnosed as kind of a 
residual other specified trauma-related disorder. And so I think that kind of dovetails into what you mentioned as role, right? So ability to take on a role. And so you were talking about there's this like a lack of insight and compartmentalization. Yeah. But yet we see she has this testing, she's been enrolled in the military, and then there's some other things that are going on that you, you were challenged to figure yeah. out how does that fit. Yeah, I, I think it was quite fascinating in that you know, she, she's, she's blind, she has very unstable relationships. A lot of her heart of, uh, she had described herself in multiple terms in terms of her childhood adolescent personality. But if she had to pick one, it was insecure, which she kind of related to people in her life always coming and going. You know, her mother uh, moved away while she was living there with her, uh, I guess with her sister. Uh, she ended up moving with uh, another aunt after the episode of the uh, aunt's husband um, propositioning her, essentially. Um, so there were these unstable kind of relationships uh, that were there that led to this insecurity. But she was doing wonderfully in school. And in terms of dynamics, we, we sometimes see uh, children of alcoholics, and there, were, there was some figures in her life that were alcoholic uh, in the home at periods of time, or, or dysfunctional families, kind of become the, quote, perfect child. Um, and externally, they do all the things they're supposed to. They function well. They probably overachieve, which to me was confirmed by differences in her IQ score and her achievement. She was, I, I kind of had a struggle with whether she had done some serious brain damage from the overdose attempt or uh, the carbon monoxide issue, which didn't seem quite that likely that it would have caused that. Um, but she was an overachiever, and she was drawn into the military from a pretty early age, became class valedictorian. Uh, so she tended to overcompensate by things and be drawn into external trappings that she was doing okay, whether it was a fancy car or kind of higher than average weapons in terms of her selection, where they weren't exactly beginner uh, choices in terms of that. Um, and, uh, you know, her uniform, uh, other things like that, the trappings of I'm doing okay. Um, and that's the external mask, which was kind of, you know, sort of really fragmented off from a lot of underlying paranoia, avoidance, suspicion, um, and repetitive engagement in some of the sexual stuff that you know we see sometimes with people who have histories of sexual trauma. And, and you noted some of the, the issues that she had suffered um, as a child, you know, with the rape and, and the abortion, and then the upward advances, uh, moving into the BDSM. And you were saying that there was that was a lack of insight, but there was also some internet searches uh, for uh, some pornography. Right. And, and how, and how does that correlate? Yeah, I, 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 the, I asked her some about the internet, internet searches, and again, given the fact that she, you know, had a close call with an incestuous relationship, or there may have been another one, another episode where someone was rubbing on her butt in the family, I believe it was the grandmother's uh, husband, and they could be a little bit wrong about that, and she's kind of lying there making pretend it's not happening and sleeping. Um, yeah, looking up inter the incestuous stuff, a lot of people who have trauma avoid those kind of things because it's, you know, kind of rekindles that type of stuff. And then you have other people who are drawn to it as part of a repetition. Like we know people who are child abusers, who are, who are abused as children, tend to abuse other children. Um, they are drawn into repeating what happened to them. And so some of her interests may have led in that direction, but boy, she just draw, drew a blank. She'd kind of giggle and look and say, I have no, I don't know. It was just, I wanted to know it was real. Um, but again, it was, it had disconnected quality to it. It, it didn't sound defensive. Um, uh, it sounded disconnected and somewhat dissociative in, in terms of my clinical feel for it. Just mention the word defensive. Uh, in your testing, did you uh, see that there was some defensiveness that perhaps was giving you the opinion that there may be more issues and more psychological issues that you're unable to diagnose? 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I foresaw that was going to be a major challenge in this case. You know, clearly she had lied to police about the body being missing. So we've established that she doesn't tell the truth at times. And she can go on, apparently, um, in, you know, with an elaborate ruse of some sort. I don't think she's very good at it. I think the, the detectives that testified uh, observed stuff that made her an easy tell. Right, she, you know, her, she, she, her behavior wasn't, you know, very convincing as maybe a practice liar might. Uh, it was out of character. But I knew that that was going to be one of my big challenges in terms of trying to interview her because I was going in knowing, boy, this is going to be a challenge, and and you know, how do I know what she's telling me is true or not? And you know, part of what we do is try to put the pieces together in terms of the history, other people's statements, what we call collateral sources of information. Uh, we have clinical intuition and judgment uh, in terms of that. Um, I didn't see, I, I didn't, you know, sh she was anxious and nervous and she would shut down, but I don't, didn't feel that she was being particularly defensive um, or outwardly lying. There were a couple of times where I thought mm, this might be a lie, there was an issue about the doll and the people who saw her, and she said, no, that couldn't have happened. Uh, that was not true because I never gave Taylor a doll. And I, had, I, I saw no reason for them to lie about that. And then I caught on the, uh, the, on the testimony that uh, he would refer to it as a doll, but then he also called it a stuffed animal, which to me made an awful lot of sense in terms of, you know, he was referring to it as a doll, but she may not have actually had a doll. And, but, she, but she picks up on little tiny details and she'll get upset with that. And I'll wonder, you know, whether she's telling the truth. A lot of times it turned out there was a pretty good explanation for it, but I was kind of trying to be vigilant for some of those types of things. Finally, we have psychological testing. And, uh, you know, uh, major tests like the PAI, the Personality Assessment Inventory, and the MMPI too, I like to give more than one major personality test in, in forensic situations. Um, have well-established measures of reliability and validity and kind of look at whether people are exaggerating or minimizing. I also used a, a standalone measure of malingering, the structured inventory for malingered symptoms, which looks at people who malinger cognitive uh, issues, which she had some because she kind of uh, described having some confusion, attention, memory problems. Uh, and given the history of the overdose and, and, and prior history, I was certainly concerned about that. Um, and then uh, that was negative. There wasn't any indication that she was malingering psychosis or affective disorder or cognitive disorders or memory problems on that test. Uh, and then on the MMPI and the PAI, she uh, tended to score defensive rather than someone who exaggerated problems. A lot of times that's a big problem. For example, when we do uh, law enforcement evals uh, or fitness for duty evals, which I do both, um, we get a lot of defensiveness. And sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes the defensiveness is so high that you really can't interpret anything. But sometimes we use different norms for police officers and so forth. Um, in criminal cases where you're claiming that you have all sorts of psychiatric problems, typically you might get a high F scale or indications that someone's exaggerating or magnifying symptoms. In her case, it was, you know, both all the instruments indicated she tend to minimize and be defensive. Um, I thought that was interesting given the circumstances. It was perfectly consistent with her self-consciousness of worrying about what people will think about her or how people see her. Right, so some of it is not admitting to some of the normal faults that we all have. I certainly have more than my fair share. Um, and what was, what was interesting is despite the defensiveness on the testing, holy moly, there was a lot of psychopathology that emerged that kind of fit with the history and my clinical impressions. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not a human lie detector, but I think overall, I think I got a pretty good read by putting together the mitigation notes, the, some of the history from uh, sta and witness statements, my own impressions, and the psychological testing. And you, you mentioned the validity scale. There, there was all of the tests that you performed uh, were valid. Correct. 
Correct. I'm sorry. Food consumption and yes. If you could just kind of speak to the the issue of I think the diagnosis. And okay, the, fair enough. Uh, the other thing that struck me on initially encountering her, I learned that she was fasting. She hadn't eaten for 18 days when I first saw her, and I'm going, oh, we're going to do testing and interview, and you're going to pass up on me, or uh, you know, what am I seeing? You know, the effects of you know, low blood sugar, you know, boy, this is going to make my life a lot more difficult. She was, even though she hadn't eaten for 18 days, she was pretty alert, answered, uh, uh, you know, again, with some of her characteristic emotional overlay. Um, she was uh, pretty alert and responded pretty well, seemed coherent, didn't seem to be, you know, impaired in that kind of way. Um, I, I did review her history of eating. Uh, even when I asked her why she was fasting, she kind of like, mm, don't know. <laughs> um, again, this disconnected flavor to it. Um, never really, you know, she did indicate that some of the early um, fasting, which she's, and extreme diets, which she's done historically, had been largely related to body image. And I did do an eating disorder inventory, which is a major uh, and frequently used test for eating disorders. And she did have a, a very um, high drive for thinness or, or, or body dissatisfaction and some other factors on that, which are very similar to people who are diagnosed with eating disorders. And I, I did diagnose that in her case. Um, but she, she clearly had a very long history of, of eating disorders. Um, and uh, further with further suspicions raised by her um, medical records after the overdose, they found some anemia, and they also found some um, internal organ abnormalities. Don't know if that might be related to the uh, neutrema or not, but she, uh, one would suspect if you're doing extreme fasting and stuff that some of those things uh, could certainly occur. Uh, certainly would be, the anemia would certainly be some indication that there was some poor nutrition uh, during a period of time before that. And, you know, part of what, uh, of the eating disorder and her own self, you know, looking at herself in the mirror, uh, people would tell her that she'd say she was fat and, she, and they would tell her, no, you need to eat more. And she would, I'm sorry, she would feel like she was fat and people would be telling her that she would eat more. So her perceptions um, of thinness, nutrition, you know, it's distorted by the historical eating disorder um, in, in terms of those types, in terms of those types of things. And with all of that, uh, was there any connection or uh, the ability to see through discussion with her in regards to the testing, uh, why Taylor would have Uh, wow. Uh, my, in discussing that with her uh, and, and looking at the records and texts and other, other types of things, my impressions were that, well certainly there was one thing that was going on was that there was a girl that Taylor was getting into some fights with. The girl seemed like she was bullying Taylor over, over uh, toys. Taylor wasn't liking going to school too much because Taylor liked to eat. So though Rihanna tended to restrict her eating a lot, uh, Taylor was uh, always eating and wanting stuff. She wanted to eat what she wanted, when she wanted, yesterday. Um, and this was a conflict with the school in terms of being on a schedule, in terms of eating. Unfortunately, uh, Rihanna wasn't sending snacks, so kind of interesting. Um, but there was this eating stuff. Um, Taylor wasn't wanting to go to school. She was having trouble with sort of daycare hours and her needs to be on base at times. Uh, 
uh, for different hours because she may have be the only one with the security keys or there was some other mission critical issue that she had to be there. She was getting in trouble with the daycare. She tends to take care of things on herself, which, which emerges as another theme when I asked her about why didn't she ask for help? Um, it was always, I always felt like I have to take care of things on my own, even when she should have asked for help. So uh, I think those things kind of came together. And I think that her own history of social anxiety, disorder, um, paranoia, uh, her discomfort with people made her over identify with Taylor's desire to avoid and stop going to school. Um, she, it was not a good decision, uh, and in fact, something that she voiced as one of her significant regrets. With, with her anxiety and paranoia, you, you kind of touched on it, uh, and it developed through a lot of her history, but there was uh, a period that started to build where she felt like she was being watched, or there was cameras, and started to order stuff offline, and uh, kind of took it to another uh, level. And was, was that something that you were using to diagnose the anxiety disorder? Yeah, it was certainly at its extreme level, anxiety turns into paranoia. I think the paranoia, you know, isn't simply situational in terms of when she's really spooked or anxious. It seems to have some of its roots in childhood and, and some of the comings and goings of people and the abuse and, and so forth. Um, so it, it does tend to be more of a personality feature or characteristic. Certainly, if you're becoming more anxious or decompensating or, or things are spinning out of control, you'd suspect the paranoia would also increase. Um, and, you know, some of the things that were discussed, such as her holding the child's hand very close when she was talking to the neighbors, um, uh, you know, possibly hiding her after the neighbors asked her, where's the child? Uh, uh, things about not asking for help because people would know where she was, um, kind of keeping a lot of the activity with men kind of only to a few close friends and stuff like that, or even, you know, the uh, uh, internet search uh, privacy browsers. I uh, didn't find that particularly unusual, especially for someone who does IT stuff. Uh, you know, it's just... Uh, uh, but you would suspect that, you know, she would be, given her paranoid f features that, and her occupation, that you would probably be a lot more uh, savvy and careful and not want to be tracked and, you know, habitually use some of those things. Uh, did you talk to her about her personal strengths and weaknesses? About, I'm sorry? Her personal strengths and weaknesses? Her personal? Strengths? Personal strengths and weaknesses, yeah. Um, that's a routine part of, you know, my history and interview. Um, and I asked her what she thought her strengths was. And clearly she volunteered a great deal when she was, you know, in the military. A lot of different activities. She was quite successful. Um, she was class valedictorian. She had a lot of stuff that she could, you know, indicate as strengths. Um, no, he just kind of blank. I'm going, okay, come on, uh, you know, and I, I pushed her some to try to get her there. And again, she would just shut down and it was blank. It was the, you know, another example of the, you know, can't, you know, doesn't feel good about herself. She can't deal with the anxiety about presenting herself and just, you know, the shutdown, semi-dissociative, you know, one step above fainting uh, kind of anxiety response that they get from her. She, she clearly could identify some weaknesses, one of which she identified as being her pride. And I asked her, oh, pride, okay. And you kind of have low self-esteem and, and you know, what, what's this pride about? And it was really pride about not, uh, about sticking to things she set herself on to. She wouldn't give up. So she, and pride about not asking for help. She had to do things on her own and that got her into trouble. When you're talking about the, the agoraphobia as a um, diagnosis, what does that mean? 
All right. Um, one of the things that we see with people who have childhood anxiety disorders, and I see a lot of college students, so I, I see this bloom a lot of time. People who have anxiety disorders or schizophrenia or bipolar have something in common. They all tend to bloom as you reach into late adolescence and early adulthood. So if you're not schizophrenic or bipolar by the time you know, you're 35 or so, chances are really pretty low. Um, anxiety disorder oftentimes starts in like middle school and, and sometimes by the time kids reach into college, it's quite overwhelming. Uh, she clearly had a hard time when she started in college. She was separated from a lot of her high school friends and that may have played a part. Um, but I see over time, she uh, develops panic attacks, and again, I have a suspicion that you know the, the incident in Virginia was, was an early panic attack. Um, but while on deployment, she's having some hallucinations when sleep deprived. She um, has some intense paranoia, starts having some panic attacks. Uh, and uh, once we, and she has classic panic attacks, she describes a pretty typical pattern and physiological symptoms of that. And once we, we have panic uh, attacks, the, the second question is, do you have agoraphobia? Uh, we used to uh, classify the whole disorder as panic disorder with agoraphobia. Um, but, you know, as we change diagnostic manuals, we have diagnoses formerly known as PRINCE, or like I've been around for as long as I am, I kind of have this is what we used to call it in the last manual, in the last manual, in the last manual before that. So now the agoraphobia is a whole separate diagnosis. So you have panic attacks, and then agoraphobia is now an additional. And that has to do with avo avoidance. You know, and she had avoidance of people that she knew at times. You know, she was avoiding going into stores to get things. Um, there was an escalation um, of some of these things. Uh, probably from Virginia uh, to after she moved to Jacksonville and, and, and uh, during that time frame. So in, in respect to that kind of characterized as almost an isolation, um, there's photographs that we have. Um, you, you've been sitting through the presentation. You've had a chance to review all of them as well. But, uh, the photographs of the apartment and the yeah. condition of the apartment. How, how does that correlate to the military? The apartment was it was obviously disgusting. It was you know uh, um, poorly kept. Um, it was dirty. It was filthy. Uh, you know, probably smelly. It, things. It, it, it was symbolic of her own external trappings of her uniform and military functioning and the internal disarray that she had. I asked her about it, and he goes, this is photographic evidence. This is like, okay, what about the diapers, and what about this stuff? Uh, and she looked at me like, no, it wasn't like that. Uh, it was just absolute, whew, you know. Um, I've seen that in, in, in a few interesting cases of extremely bright people. One was a physicist, another one was a, a well-published author, who one was involved in a criminal case, the other one was involved in just personal family stuff of hoarding where you would have a hoarding disorder, which is considered to fly along the anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive uh, dimensions, which she, she's not, um, to, that, that can have the psychotic denial and just this lack of reality, lack of appreciation for it. Uh, in one case, despite a lot of photographic evidence, witnesses, um, that was the delusional thing that there was a vast conspiracy for everyone to change the, di the time stamps on the photographs. And it was a very sophisticated article, very, very uh, argument. It was a very, very intelligent person. You wouldn't think anything was wrong with this particular individual by talking to her, but wow, the distortion of what her place was, they had to burn it down and then burn the hazmat material, <laughs> the hazmat suits. It was that bad. And, and so that, um, so, so the way Yeah, it, it, the other thing that was, I think, significant about that was it was a change. 
her mother made a remark that, quote, she must have gone off the deep end because when she had visited Taylor, maybe the few times she did, she always kept a clean apartment. Um, that seemed to go along with some other statements that changes had happened in Brianna's personality. Um, uh, I think it was Ms. Frazier uh, who testified earlier, uh, who had, uh, uh, I think in Warkenstein's uh, investigation, mentioned that somewhere between 2015 and 2016, she, her personality really seemed to change uh, from someone being quiet to like, wow, it was like wasn't her anymore. Uh, did she end up talking to you about um, the event of Taylor's death and, and what she remembers happening? Yes. Um, yeah. She, she put it off. Um, try, to try to reduce anxiety, I kind of try to give people um, a choice about whether they just want to launch into that uh, or whether they want to wait till later. Uh, I saw her over, th again, three and a half days, so I had some leeway. Uh, I don't know if I really was planning three and a half days, but <laughs> I knew I, I had an opportunity to come back. Uh, and she put it off, uh, not surprising given her social anxiety avoidance kind of issues. Sometimes when people have a big story and they've made up a lot of stuff, they want to get right to it. I've certainly been there, seen there, and done that. Um, she put it off. Uh, and the best that I could understand and my sense of it, my reaction was, boy, this is anticlimactic, right? What happened? Well, I woke up and she was dead. Um, and boy, it was, you know, uh, you know, this big mystery of sort of what had happened and what was going on. There was an awful lot of explanation for it. Um, the best that she could recall, and what she told me, was that somewhere toward the end of September and October, um, she had a hard time pinpointing it exactly. The IHOP purchase might be relevant because she recalled buying Halloween waffles. Uh, and she knew Halloween waffles, and it was, it was sometime when they had introduced that. So it was somewhere around the weekend, one of the weekends uh, there. Uh, she was up, it was a Saturday, she was studying, which seemed to be consistent with her planner and diary. She had studying scheduled on that. Um, and um, it, it, was, it was in the evening, Taylor had wanted to stay up and was eating some stuff, wanted to eat and, and uh, watch uh, some movie or, or something on um, some video or electronic thing with her. Uh, Brianna was studying, was tired. Brianna went to sleep early. Uh, no, she took some uh, over-the-counter sleep medications or not. Um, interestingly, she was comfortable with um, Taylor staying up and putting herself to bed. And that, that evidently, that was kind of not unusual for, for her. Uh, she, uh, Brianna slept till around 11 o'clock noon the next day. It was when she kind of noticed something was odd because uh, Taylor would typically get up very early and be up and about, and whatever. She said she searched uh, for her on the bed, under the bed, uh, before she found her in the closet, slumped over, thought she was asleep, tried to wake her up, but she, slumped, she, she fell over and was cold. And at that point in time, she, you know, kind of describes just really not knowing what to do, kind of being in shock. Left the apartment twice, I think she indicated uh, that particular time. On one of them, she picked up groceries from Walmart, according to her report that she had ordered days before or something, or at some time before online. Um, she couldn't bear bringing herself into the area where uh, Taylor was. Her thoughts were that she wanted to kill herself. And she didn't know what to do, but she was intent on killing herself. Um, she drove around a lot. Um, she, she wondered whether the, how far the bullet would go in her head if she shot herself and whether she would survive. I've actually seen some people shot themselves in the head and survived. It's, it's a realistic concern, um, not something most people would be familiar with. Um, 
she indicated that she she didn't go back to the apartment for a period of time so i think she had the to the apartment in the house so there may have been a period of time where she actually didn't return to the apartment she couldn't be or doing that and continue to have suicidal thoughts wanted to bury have her buried and she came up with this idea of wanting to bury her next to her grandfather given the attachments were rather one of the issues here was kind of was there attachment disorders or disruptions and attachments and certainly they were why the grandfather grandfather died fairly early on you know in her life there were a lot less negative and conflicted memories that might have something to do with it but she couldn't tell me that and why did you want to bury her next to your grandfather and again it was this i don't know it's just absolutely this disconnected but that's what i wanted to do she she described driving uh she just described putting uh taylor in a container said it was easy to get her out of the apartment neighbors wouldn't notice and that she drove up to where she thought the grandfather's grave would be uh could not find it um became somewhat distraught uh placed it in a place where she thought she could find again and she returned and again her plans continued to be going back up there trying to find her barrier with her grandfather and then commit suicide um when she went back up there to try to find her she couldn't uh so that became another uh issue of anxiety for her um and she didn't tell me this but i i have uh, um the, she did tell me or the mitigation specialist I'm having a hard time differentiating between two right this moment is there was a statement that she made is that she wanted Taylor's body to be found and in addition to the obvious I don't want to maybe I don't want to get caught and and maybe I'm going to pull this big ruse um I wonder whether part of the search and saying that she's gone actually kind of had something to do with her wanting to find the the body and have it buried and for her to commit suicide because I asked her were you just buying yourself time you know and and in terms of uh you know doing things um and you know it was it was about there was something about finding her body that was that seemed significant real it was disconnected from anything else it wasn't a long discussion it wasn't overly elaborated or exaggerated or you know drawing for sympathy um but it was another one of the, the threads in her puzzle um that seemed to make a little bit of sense to me and uh may have been an additional motivation I certainly don't know all of her motivations she, there was a lot of I don't know what I was thinking and it was disconnected dissociative kind of uh feeling like I I didn't think she had dissociative amnesia which sometimes people who are prone to anxiety they can literally forget parts of what it she didn't claim that she didn't claim i didn't remember um but you know it, it, does it fall along that dimension i got a little bit of a sense that there was a lot of dissociative disconnected stuff that was going on with her and you you mentioned um Taylor going to bed late that that didn't seem to be an issue and kind of like child rearing yeah. uh, that she was doing uh leaving her home unattended while she was at work uh Does that correlate to childhood or trauma or is it is it something that that correlates to Yeah uh you know Yeah, I I I I try to confront her some about like what were you thinking or like you know this is really inappropriate for a child. She really had a bit of an unrealistic sense of what Taylor could do on her own. She said, "Oh, she could, you know, I I would put, you know, food and sandwiches on the counter. She could reach the counter. I took the rings off the stove so she wouldn't burn herself. In fact, I I think one of the photographs shows the rings on the stove in the apartment being uh gone. Um and um you know and then, and I kind of then pressed what about her social needs you know she's you know clearly the records show that she's not going to school and she's kind of like you know doing, how about playing with other children and, and she would say that I brought her to the park a couple of times and unfortunately 
uh, Taylor would be rejected by the other kids, and it wasn't a pleasant experience for her. Um, and then she, you know, didn't bring her back anymore to the park because it wasn't fun. Um, again, I think some of Brianna's own social anxiety and, and pain, interpersonal pain probably played a part to that. The Brianna never indicated there wasn't enough food at home, but it was mostly there were people coming and going. Sometimes they would be left alone. Um, so that may have played some role in terms of her not perceiving uh, things quite accurately um, uh, in, in terms of risks, you know, what would be appropriate. Uh, but it, it's a natural level of, let's say, <coughs> Well, insanity would be, you know, the legal definition in the state of Florida would be along the lines that you had a mental illness and you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. I think if you ask Rihanna what's right and wrong and what's appropriate nutrition or not, she could give you textbook answers. She knew what was right and what was wrong. She would not be insane in that sense. Did she have a full appreciation of the reality of, you know, the condition? You know, uh, that's certainly questionable because just as the reality about the messiness of the apartment, which she seems to not really grasp in the same way that we are kind of shocked by it, or some of the people that I've seen who have hoarding disorders, uh, it, it's very possible that her sense of reality and dissociation or, or other stuff didn't allow her to completely grasp uh, Brianna deteriorating and her eating disorder might have actually caused her problems in recognizing she was getting too thin. Um, so there were things that will probably altered her sense of reality, but I would not uh, think that she would meet any classic definition of insanity under, uh, under the law. I'm not sure if it happened after deployment or before deployment. It certainly seemed to develop somewhere around the time of 2015-16 as she was get, having to go to training and deployments and stuff like that. She had, uh, there was something that she had indicated uh, when the father would watch her and kind of felt like the father really wasn't spending a lot of time with her even though he was watching her there was an incident in which she showed um, taylor photographs of family members and she didn't uh, recognize mr tate the father i believe um, i don't know if that prompted some of her fear that you know if she was on deployment she'd be gone that you know taylor but but she recalled having this sense of paranoia and fear about that um, and when you look at her own attachments um, and um, you know disruptions of people coming and going certainly her deployments and trainings and going off to other family members um, would parallel would, they, they would parallel each other and so her fears that there might be changes uh, I think were grounded on that but the fear of you might not recognize your own mother after that short of a separation certainly reflected a certain degree of, of, of paranoia. Now, she would say that when they, 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 they would cry and, 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 and um, Taylor would, would cry about the pending separation, so she had some anticipation about that, which suggests that she probably did have some attachment and bond uh, with Brianna. Brianna, as would be her style, and per her mom's report, no, nobody has really seen her cry as an adult, typically. Uh, 
Brianna would cry about the separations, but after after Taylor was in bed or asleep, she'd she'd cry uh, on her own about that. But when she, when she returned, and I suspected that this might impact on the attachment, um, and, and the attachment and empathy are kind of connected and kind of you know feeling for the other. Um, Taylor had some other challenges in terms of speech therapy, which may have speech issues or language issues may have made it difficult for her to communicate her feelings and needs, which is a risk for some attachment stuff or, or, or miscommunications at least. Um, that Brianna's view was that they were closely attached and nothing changed after they got back together. But what we also have is that, uh, though Bri Brianna didn't feel differently, Taylor's, I mean, we see this in some of the texts, Taylor's um, hiding stuff under the bed, um, leaving trash around. She had a regression in, in toileting. Before deployment, Ms. Williams described, because it's one of the things I would normally ask about child development as I'm going through the history with Taylor, um, Brianna had taken a very systematic and methodological approach to totally training her before deployment. Um, and something went awry <laughs> when she came back because the, she was back in diapers and she was soiling herself for a period of time. And there were some of these food hiding behaviors um, after deployment. So something, something transpired there that caused a regression uh, in Taylor's behavior. Uh, Brianna, despite the fact all these soiled diapers are around, Brianna says that she rarely had accidents, which doesn't quite fit, doesn't seem realistic. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, but that she actually eventually succeeded at, at, at toilet training uh, Taylor again after the deployment, but it took some time and effort. Now, you had mentioned that No, I'm not sure if I quite understand that one. Okay. Uh, are, are people able to observe her behavior and know what she's thinking? Th that would be kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> I hope, to, hope that doesn't happen to me. Uh, the, the, what, what, I have, what I have, and it's pieces of the puzzle, was mom in, in an interview kind of describing Brianna as always being odd, kind of a bit on the outside. Uh, we have Mr. Tate saying that she was always off, right? Uh, we have this personality change kind of stuff and we have her own self-report that she was socially anxious, right? Uh, and I have my observations that boy, when I interact with her, she seems, you know, very classically schizoaffective if, if I just had to do based on observation and and feeling my, you know, that would have been one of my first, you know, roads I would go down there. So my interaction with about that schizoaffective stuff fits perfectly with the other people seeing that she's odd. Now she can get misread, you know, because people who have schizoaffective disorders have odd affect. They giggle, their affect can be flat. And so, you know, people can read that as, you know, you're being, you know, jovial or inappropriate or, or you're being cold and distant. Um, so, you know, so, I, but, I, but I do think that because she had this characteristic personality and, and, and these psychiatric issues that people could perceive her in different ways. And so that's why I get to her interview, the initial interview that you watched the video and you heard testimony that she's playing overly emotional, she's not really shaking Showing signs that this is something that is a problem. What's your take on, on Yeah, I, I, you know, unfortunately, we've all seen f 
false abduction claims on television, right? So we have experience uh, in the general media and public of seeing some of these, you know, emotional displays. Uh, so one would look at that and, you know, knowing that that was the case in a very cynical kind of way. Um, and, and I can tend to be cynical at times. Um, and, uh, you know, her crying uncontrollably is not characteristic her. Um, clearly she's crying pretty uncontrollably, you know, in, in that particular incident. She never really cried uncontrollably with me. Uh, on the verge of tears when she'd talk about Taylor at times. And there was a time, I think, in the mitigation interviews when she talked some about some of the traumas and, 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 and Taylor where she actually became uh, a little bit hard to console. Um, you know, clearly she's putting on a bit of a show, right? And cynical knees go like, that's kind of a, a pretty obvious types of thing. But one of the things that's also kind of psychologically meaningful to me, especially in the context of her compartmentalizing, denying, shutting things out, dissociating things, is this time that she's talking and claiming that Taylor is dead, it's really the first public time she's acknowledging and breaking the reality that Taylor is not there. Now she's not saying she's dead, but she's coming closer to reality. And I suspect that what you're seeing is probably part show and part, oh my gosh, I'm kind of, I can't deny this anymore, that this is really happening. Well, you know, looking at the, you know, look at the, at the interviews, you know, when she was being interviewed after, uh, you know, at the uh, police station, looking at, you know, the videotape of her stuff, um, she's not a terribly good liar. She has what we would call a lot of tells, right, which the detectives astutely picked up on, right? You know, she, she glances out, she's, you know, looking, you know, she's just doing things that are odd and atypical for that type of situation. Uh, I didn't see a lot of that behavior, you know, in my interviews. Again, I saw anxiety and a tendency more to shut down. Uh, I think she considered the questions. And I think, by and large, my clinical impressions, intuitions, you know, some of the information that I kind of tried to pull from the puzzle of the statements that people made and the test results were all pretty consistent. And certainly the test results didn't suggest that she was putting on a big show. She never created some psychiatric excuse for what she did. She, I think she's disconnected with her own, again, the insight's not there as to the things that contributed to her. I've had to try to figure this out in some kind of way.
Good morning. I want to talk to you about, there were a bunch of tests that you did with employees, right? Correct. Um, specifically on page 16 of your report, you mentioned a malingering test. Correct. Your finding, um, it states that she's within normal limits, suggesting she was not grossly exaggerating psychotic effective or neurocognitive complaints. Not that grossly exaggerating. Can you explain what that means? The definition of malingering is, is gross exaggeration in, in the DSM. So that's that would be synonymous with malingering. Okay. Can you explain to the court how that test is done? Uh, it's a paper and pencil test. Uh, we administer it though. She endorses various items. Um, some of them are per, you know, are, are pretty unusual, uh, and someone might see through them. Other ones look very similar to psychotic symptoms or memory symptoms, but they're actually selected because true people with those disorders don't endorse them. They just look like that. So the items are designed to simulate and resemble that, and the test has been used uh, both as a screening instrument, as part of a larger battery, to help differentiate between people who are exaggerating uh, for primary gain. I do an awful lot of uh, personal injury types of stuff, and so people would be exaggerating because they want to, you know, get the big check because of an injury, uh, or in criminal situations where they want to avoid uh, responsibility. And so it's been used in those settings to try to help uh, make a determination about whether someone's playing it up or not. Is there a score that someone is given? Yes. And then if they fall on the high end of the score, is that when you determine if... Uh, the, 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 the way that that test is largely interpreted is based on cutoff scores. <laughs> you, uh, the cutoff scores, if, if you endorse more than a couple of them on some items, um, you're suspected of malingering, so you don't have to endorse an awful lot of unusuals. So... Um, some people might criticize it's too sensitive, um, but it's it's generally it's generally fair. So it's uh, um, if someone's scoring below the cutoffs, which are pretty low, uh, they're probably not exaggerating. Okay, uh, Dr. Bordini, there was a lot of talk about information that you received from the defense. Correct. You interviewed her, correct? Yes. And a lot of this is self-reporting. History, whether we're, when we're doing that clinically in every situation, would mostly be self-report, except when, when we do uh, psychological autopsies. Did you do anything to fact-check the things that she was telling you? Um, I didn't do my own personal investigation, but I kind of cross-referenced uh, and tried to consider what was consistent or not consistent with the collateral information. So. In forensic situations, we really just want to depend on what somebody says. Uh, in fact, I do an awful lot of uh, employer referrals uh, in terms of people who are in trouble at work, and I don't want to just have an employee come in and tell me, oh, my boss is bad. We, we gather collateral information to try to uh, see what's consistent or not. You know, in this, in this particular case, obviously, there's been uh, just an enormous amount of materials, right, which you all work through a lot. So in those materials, uh, I noticed that you reviewed text messages, screenshots of text messages. What specifically did you review when it comes to this? Well, there were the text messages that were uh, presented this morning, so I, I was aware of some of those. I don't know if I had both sides of the conversation on some of those, so I think some of them I only had uh, Ms. Williams part of the conversation, so some of it was missing. But, you know, what I saw in the text messages that you presented uh, today seemed familiar. I've seen some of those. So you've seen a range of text messages from September to, through November? Correct. Okay. Um, you also talked about, in the beginning, your initial take on Brianna Williams and yeah. how she appeared to you. Right. Do you take into consideration the fact that she is in jail and facing potentially a life sentence? Uh, I've been there and done that, so that's not an unusual situation. I know how people react in those situations. She was really different. So do all people react the same? No. Okay, so that could change a person's personality if they know you're there to interview them about potential mental mitigation. Right. And they're facing life in prison. 
Yeah, I've, I've done death penalty cases. I've done death penalty appeals. I've interviewed people who are facing very grave uh, potential consequences. You, one of my big challenges is try to uh, put people at ease and get them to be able to talk. So that's my first challenge as I enter it. I've got a pretty good experience of interviewing lots of people in high stakes criminal and high stakes multi-million dollar civil lawsuits. Um, I, 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 I interview people for fitness or duty evals for law enforcement, all sorts of situations. I have a big database of how people react under initial interviews. She was very unusual, even amongst all the people that I've seen. She looked very schizoaffective, and that's kind of what I testified to. But you didn't diagnose her with that? No, it was something that had that feeling. If someone were to diagnose that, it would be, a, it, it would be kind of an interesting debate, but I didn't settle on that. I, don't, I, I, I tend to diagnose conservatively, so I didn't think I had enough to, to make that full diagnosis. Um, I don't know what you, what you mean, variability in the diagnosis. That's, you talked about variability in her personality and how it fit within the things that you were looking at to diagnose her with. I don't know if that's exactly what I said. Well, what I indicated is that she could present differently. Okay. You know, that she, when she was in a role, she could present in a very different way, like when she was at work. Um, she was in uniform. She obviously um, had a different suit of armor or a different personality on. Okay. Could that be indicative of someone who's manipulative? Um, someone who's manipulative will change that back and forth to get something in any given minute, minute. I think in her circumstance, you had a role which characterized the majority of her working life where she was well, described as a leader, a rising star. Uh, she could manage, you know, pretty large numbers of computer systems, security issues. Uh, she was seen as a depend-on person, despite the fact that she, underneath it, she was really insecure. That's not manipulative. You know, that's not someone who's changing, that, you know, her presentation, you know, to get extra leave or an extra promotion or, or doing that kind of stuff. Uh, what we're talking about is really differences in roles and periods of time, and she was able to do that. Whether she used that to manipulate, it's kind of, kind of a se separate question. Um, nobody described her as manipulative in terms of her military stuff. She was exemplary. She was kind of uh, put up as being an, an example of a sailor. So she certainly didn't do that at work, or nobody picked up on it. And I, military people and leaders can tend to be as cynical as I am sometimes. So you would agree that if <laughs> No. no, no, that's that, that's 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 totally absurd. Um, I've done pre-employment interviews and interviews on for fitness for duties, on law enforcement officers, FDLE, FBI, the whole nine yards. Um, people do not tell you all the bad stuff when you're being interviewed for a clearance or for that. I know multiple people with top secret clearances who have psychiatric histories, DUIs the whole nine yards, people are not going to tell you their inner secrets because it's going to ruin your career, your chances to get in. And in the military and law enforcement, that's a big problem. We have large suicide rates, uh, which are unfortunate and well known to everybody uh, because there is a culture of not wanting to admit stuff because you may jeopardize your promotion or your clearance. So, you know, you know what you're proposing is, is preposterous. That she had some, uh, some sort of fixation when it comes to food. She had an she had an eating disorder, and yes, she was. You know, people who have alcohol problems get, get overly preoccupied with alcohol. People who have eating disorders get overly preoccupied with the details of eating. It's 
start, start the beginning part of it, I think I missed the, the predicate or the, the first part. Yes, sir. Um, there is a change in Taylor's routine. Right. Correct? And part of the reason that this defendant gives for that change in routine is because Taylor is a big eater, right? Yeah. And she doesn't like to schedule at school. Correct. Okay. So she keeps her home. Yes. So she can eat whenever she wants. Not great parenting, but correct. <laughs> Yeah. At this time. Um, in that same portion of your interview, it's mentioned that she said she didn't put Taylor on a diet. Did you ask her that question or did she offer that up? I asked her. I was very, yeah, I, I, I tried to probe as to whether she shared her own unusual fasts and weird, he, well, weird, not a great word, but unusual restrictive eating habits, whether she and Taylor would do that together or whether Taylor, she would do that. Um, yes, yeah, you know, I tried to push that, probe it in a couple of different ways, uh, didn't get anything. Um, essentially what she would say is, you know, she, I, I specifically, when she said she'd cook, I was like, okay, now what were you cooking? Because, you know, we didn't see a lot of cooking stuff other than a bunch of dirty dishes and pans. So dirty dishes and pans, you gotta cook. Um, but she kind of said, you know, she'd bake broccoli and chicken, <clears throat> you know, and she was kind of specific with that. Uh, she came up with that pretty quickly. Didn't seem like it was a big delay and she was making it up. But, uh, but yeah, I tried to probe that. I tried to push that because it, was, it would be a concern of mine that given her eating disorder, uh, that she would, could potentially see Taylor as overweight because she's eating and now she's putting Taylor on a diet. Uh, I would obviously be concerned about that. I, I didn't, couldn't, couldn't pick up a thread, couldn't pick up a hint that that was going on. Okay, Doctor, it's funny that you mentioned what you just mentioned because the defendant also says that Taylor would tend to binge. Sorry? Taylor would tend to binge. Binge eating. Okay, that's yeah, co correct, that. yes, and, I, and, and that, that's consistent with what she told me. Yeah. Well, I, I think she would tell me that she, yeah, that, that essentially, I don't know if she were, used the word binge, but that, you know, she would overeat at times. She would eat like a whole pizza or she would, you know, she would uh, consume, you know, whatever was there. Uh, she wouldn't self-modulate that. Uh, maybe I started that way, I'm not sure, but. So, Doctor, your report uses the word binge. So, is that your word or her word? Um, have to go back to my original notes. I don't really recall at this point. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, the, the, her own searches may reflect either her own concerns about herself or about Taylor. Uh, they certainly aren't specific with respect to that. Well, first of all, it's a presumption that she died of malnourishment. We, <laughs> we really don't know. Um, what that meant to her psychologically, was this in the original apartment or was it in the new, uh, in the new house? It's in the Ivy Street house, the staged house. In the, in the quote, staged house? Uh, my assumption is that 
Taylor probably died in the other apartment. She may never have seen this. It may not have had any psychological significance at all. I don't know. Right. And there's a box of crackers on it. Correct. Do you think that that may have some psychological importance, maybe a message? I, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, my, my feeling is that the material in the Ivy Street house was as the detectives kind of figured that it was staged. It was, it occurred after probably they have died. So the psychological significance was you know part of trying to uh, create the appearance that she had been kidnapped. It wasn't a really good job at it, but you know I, I, I think it's pretty transparent. I don't think it really has deep psychological meaning because I think probably Taylor was dead by that time. No meaning to her, but a practical attempt at trying to make it look like she was kidnapped. So. This doesn't have meaning, but all the other... All the other things she's doing to herself, the tattoos, the breast augmentation, the dieting, all of those have some sort of psychological significance. Yeah, those, those have psychological significance in, you know, in that they're the external trappings of being okay or strong. It's an overcompensation, you know, in terms of trying to have, you know, the great-looking car and, you know... Uh, enhancing her appearance, uh, you know, and doing those things, it's, it's an overcompensation for what's underneath. Um, and I think that, to me, had, you know, that, that wasn't a really um, far leap to make in terms of trying to understand her psychologically. Um, you know, she had issues with food, and food would be meaningful, uh, you know, in, in different ways. <coughs> but you know, what you're showing me here, like, that that's really doesn't have a lot to do with what led up to it. Okay. Um, let's talk about that apartment. So, uh, you mentioned that, and you just said again, that the apartment was symbolic of her external trappings and internal disarray, right? I, I believe that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I got this denial that I've seen maybe, you know, about a really disastrous, messy apartment that I've really seen in maybe a few cases in my clinical career, all of which were really kind of tinged by some psychotic uh, denial and dissociation, just had that flavor to it. Couldn't it also be indicative of her not wanting to admit something because she knows it's uh, it's conceivable that that's the case, but, you know, admitting something like I didn't feed my child versus my apartment was messy, and yes, there were diapers there, um, especially when you have photographic evidence, here's the dirty diapers, you know, and I mentioned that we did what the evidence was, um, you know, it, it would, you know, to kind of deny it because it's going to be convenient to you, uh, it, it's, you know, she's smarter than that, and it doesn't make any sense in any kind of way. Uh, it's an easier thing to admit to. Um, so it had this other flavor to it um, that I can only relate, you know, to some of these unusual hoarding with psychosis cases that I've seen. Okay. Um, so you were asked about insanity, and clearly you're not saying she's insane. Correct. But you're saying that she doesn't yeah, depersonalization, derealization, dissociation is some alteration of reality that falls short of schizophrenia or dissociative identity disorder, which would be like a multiple personality disorder. Um, it's a lower, you know, it, it, the distortions aren't quite that bad. I, I, I wondered about all of those issues uh, and kind of reviewed the diagnostic criteria, whether you know, I could make those diagnoses within kind of a reasonable degree of probability. I didn't feel like I could. I did feel like there was some pretty significant dissociation and derealization, though. What makes it dissociation versus just not wanting to admit the truth? Uh, it's, they have things in common. They have more in common than not. 
Um, uh, at one level, if we think about psychological defenses, uh, and uh, we kind of describe denial as being one step above fainting. Now, we can look at denial in a criminal sense, but we can also look at denial as a coping mechanism for psychological disorganization, distress, trauma. So uh, we know, and, and you know, as, as a prosecutor, you probably had some experience with this, we know that people who are sexually abused may blank out parts of what's real. And they are prone to having some dissociative dis, 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 phenomena when other things remind them of things or it can recur. Um, and so it's often trauma related uh, and there is this blanking out of some of the reality aspects. So for example, even though we think about these hoarders as having nothing to do with abuse because they're just hoarding cats or whatever it is, it turns out that they often have a history of trauma and abuse. And this alteration of reality, though they're not schizophrenic and, and, or anything like a bipolar or a major mental illness, there is some real serious distortions of reality. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I, I can I, I can I can answer more than a yes or no as an expert. You know that. Yes, sir. But Thank you. No. I, so so go ahead and repeat that, and I'll answer. Just because I'm the one that's got to consider the evidence. So respond directly to the question. Yeah. Uh, if you need to explain the answer you yeah. give, I want to hear it. Thank you. It'll either be through the next question asked by the prosecutor, or on redirect by the person who called you. Okay, thank you. Ask the question, please. Yes, sir. You would agree that she knows the difference between right and wrong? Yes. Could she articulate to you what her role as a parent is versus Taylor's role as a child? Um, I don't think she, I think she could give you the right answer. I didn't specifically ask that question. Um, do I think she could articulate it? Yes. Do I think she has a solid grasp on it? Probably not. So prior to her moving to Jacksonville, she understood her role as a parent. She was getting, you heard the testimony, she was getting child care. Yes. But then she moves to Jacksonville and in April of 2019, she just stopped with the child care. Well, so that's certainly the, the period of time that she stopped the child care. I, I, my, I made efforts to try to figure out when did things change and we have sort of a trail of some personality changing changes in her sometime before deployment that's kind of described, you know, by uh, Ms. Frazier uh, during the investigation to Walkenstein. And the mother who's saying that she must have changed and gone off the deep end because of the changes in her apartment care. I think there's a photograph of uh, Taylor in the apartment around June that was time stamp that I think uh, uh, defense uh, provided uh, that looks like obviously the, the, the apartment was in disarray by June. So sometime, and we know that or suspect that Taylor's behavior changed after deployment. So there's a, a number of things that lead up to this April issue. I don't think it was like one day she just, you know, changed. There's probably multiple contributors to that happening. Also possibly the fact that she was looked like she had a lot more responsibilities. So those responsibilities, did you ask her if those became more important than Taylor? No, uh, you know, it, it would be convenient for her to say that she was stressed by, you know, the duties. She tended to say they were easy. It, it kind of would contradict that. That those were yes, obviously. They were not the truth. They, they, yeah, she was she was making up a story about the child being kidnapped. Okay. Now the emotions partially true, partially untrue. She probably uh, channeled both. Okay. Um, so when you sat down with her and you asked her about Taylor's death, and she gave you a story, why did you accept that? 
Uh, I'm not a lie detector. Uh, it, she, the things that raise my concerns that I've drawn to clinically and trying to put the thing, weren't things that she was selling, you know? I mean, I kind of know when someone's selling me a story in terms of psychopathology, um, she would tend to minimize and deny or shut down when I tried to, you know, pull more out in terms of uh, unusual experiences or stuff. It was really something, um, you know, that was a lot more subtle than that. Uh, her demeanor uh, was very different when talking about Taylor and this. It was very uh, quiet, uh, anxious. Uh, she seemed to consider what she was thinking. And clearly there were times when it would have been convenient for her to maybe say, you know, that she was losing her mind or anything like that. She never came even close to anything like that. Uh, I think I've tried to put the pieces of the puzzle together from little fragments that she would allow here and there, but she was more guarded than selling a story in terms of my interactions with her. So her story is that on sometime between September, the end of September, beginning of October, she remembers it because she bought She's trying, to, she's trying to peg the weekend. And again, you have a high hop receipt, which, you know, if you kind of give that week and then say that she kind of didn't go to the apartment for a couple of weeks and kind of was confused for a week, then you kind of, we're kind of coming toward the end of October, beginning of November, when she kind of makes the thing. So some of that time frame makes some sense to me in, in that way. I'm, I'm, there, there's probably some other evidence that may contradict it, but... Um, you know, uh, the fact that I learned this morning that was that that was the date of the the high hop receipt certainly tended to confirm rather than disconfirm what she told me. Well, doctor, we have this lead form. Did you ask her when this death happened in relation to, to her asking for leave? Um, to me, it was pretty obvious that she asked for leave after Taylor's death because she went up to bury the body. So it wasn't something I thought of asking her. I mean, it's one preceded the other. But I guess the, the question is, how long is she in the apartment with her dead child? Um, again, per her report, and I, I don't, you know, I don't have forensic evidence uh, to indicate this, but per her report of the weekend, it was probably the weekend of the IHOP receipt, which would have been the beginning of October, end of September. Okay, so it's almost close to a month she said she like didn't go back to the apartment for a couple of weeks and she was confused for a week going back and forth the so that would have that that kind of makes sense to me uh you know it, is that you know the, does a, for all the forensics evidence support that or not i, I, I don't know that didn't don't do like i'm not an evidence tech <laughs> you know in that sense but it, it made it made sense there was some consistency to it Absolutely. Would you be shocked if she continued to text message with people like nothing happened? No, that, that, that seems part of the, she's, she's an IT tech who's probably creating a track of everything seems fine because she doesn't know what to do. And, and, and so, you know, no, I, don't, I don't find that particularly, you know, uh, unusual. She's functioning at work. She's making pretend everything is okay. Uh, and according to her, she's buying time to, uh, you know, go up, bury the body, um, f go back and find her. Uh, so this, you know, so some of this mask or charade is kind of a practical, um, <laughs> a practical thing to do in terms of trying to get to her end result of, either burying the body or doing herself off or getting away with it. I don't know the underlying motive of all those. So she's playing a role. She's, she's playing a role and she's, you know, she's, she seems like she's creating, uh, you know, or trying to create, not really in a very good way, uh, you know, sort of, you know, this, um, you know, I guess it would be electronic staging, 
it would be kind of a good way to describe it. So basically, she's manipulating her situation. At that time, yes, absolutely. She, she, she indicates there was a little detail about a bottle of Tylenol being nearby that was empty. She thought maybe she could have overdosed on Tylenol. She kind of ruled that out in her head because there wasn't any vomit. So she didn't think that that was <coughs> the cause. Doctor, what she describes to you is essentially an accident, isn't it? Is what? I don't know. I, I don't know if she thought it was an accident or that she, I think she really came up with a blank in terms of, she, she talked about driving around trying to think about what could happen. So, um, you know, the, the, the Tylenol, if that was the, a contributor to that, um, you know, obviously I don't think the five-year-old was trying to commit suicide, but it certainly would be kind of a, uh, just uh, an equal kind of bit of negligence in terms of allowing, you know, a whole bottle of <laughs> Tylenol being around. So I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, didn't ever got the sense that she was trying to present this as an accident. I think basically as far as she got was, I don't know what happened. And in the few things when I kind of tried to push her in the, late, the last interviews as to regrets, remorse and so forth, she clearly, you know, wish she made a different decision about keeping her home um, because ultimately that kind of, you know, was, was the uh, sort of the beginning of, of, of whatever had happened. Um, but the other was that she, she had really some regret or remorse about not calling the police right away or calling the hospital or, or taking her to the hospital to find out what happened. Uh, factors in that. Um, when I asked her why not, um, was, uh, goes back to her paranoia, but also some social cultural stuff that was probably going on at the time. Uh, she mentioned that police shoot people. Uh, I happen to work with a lot of law enforcement. I think that's not a good perception, but I understand that some people feel that way and, sh and, her, and that would fit in with some of her paranoia. Um, and and she actually seemed quite naive, and in my report you'll see that there's aspects of her that seem really quite naive, which for most lay people doesn't fit with being paranoid, but that's a very common um, personality dynamic, and also on the testing, the, the, the naivete scale actually falls on the paranoia scale. Uh, she's somewhat naive that, you know, maybe they could have figured out what, what caused her death. Um, that she just kind of like, oh gosh, yeah, maybe that, that was true. But she, she was overwhelmed uh, with the death and I think she probably had a lot stronger of a dissociative reaction and episode after she died. She was, you know, confused. Um, she was in denial psychologically. Uh, I've seen that, you know, in people who've committed purposeful murders, you know, after the actual death um, for there to be this sense of depersonalization, derealization. Uh, because even though, even, you know, you may imagine what it's like when you kill somebody, uh, even if you have to do so as a law enforcement officer, uh, it's something that really is a psychological trauma. Doctor, you're aware that she pled to second degree murder, correct? Correct. I think it's that's her taking responsibility for that, and and again, it may be or may have been her best option given what was on the table. I'm certainly not privy to her attorney, the state attorneys, and other people's negotiations about pleas. So um, that's usually not somewhere uh, I go in an interview because it, it tends to sort of delve into uh, attorney-client privilege. Would you? Oh, 
Oh, yeah, certainly. So her denial about the, the feces, so feces underwear, the urine soap bed, the apartment in disarray, the inconsistencies from her interviews, why in looking at all of that was this the first well, the, 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 like again, I was kind of surprised about the denial about things that there's just photographic evidence about. Her credibility is already being questioned because she came up with this big ruse. Um, so I see the denial about what's right there as not being self-serving. I see it as quite bizarre. No, it's a speculation. I, it was something, you know, the, my, I was aware that of the witnesses saying that Taylor was wandering about and that she was waving. Um, and, you know, certainly that's, you know, direct witness testimony about, you know, the child being unsupervised. Um, Obviously, we have some contradiction with the dates and um, that were was kind of highlighted earlier. But I, I was I didn't know that, and I'm assuming that that was accurate. Um, and so, you know, my I guess I'm wondering, you know, why Taylor's not seen after that, right? And her report to me is. No, that didn't happen. Um, you know, Taylor couldn't have been outside because there was no doll, which to me sounded like a lie or, or it, it just didn't make an awful lot of sense to me. And I'm, I was trying to make, trying to understand it. Um, in terms of the, the, the hiding is when I learned, I guess, that they had gone back and asked her about whether they could care for her, uh, it was just, it's just pure speculation, given her paranoia, that if she became aware that they knew she was in, that she was alone in the apartment or whatever, and she was somewhat paranoid about other people watching her, and she had this paranoia about even pictures on Facebook, because she got really mad with the dad for posting some pictures on Facebook. Um, she, she had a lot of paranoia about protecting Taylor. And where, whether that had something to do with maybe scaring Taylor, but boy, I'm going, this is not stuff that she told me. I'm really trying to put parts of the puzzle together and speculation. I, boy, if, speculating exactly how she hit her would be like even speculation upon speculation. Um, I certainly can't rule it out. Um, but uh, I find that a bit, I find it a bit hard to believe. But, uh, you know, my Taylor was afraid of going out, according to uh, Brianna. Um, that kind of makes sense in, in the fact that both Brianna had a lot of childhood fears um, and anxiety disorders can often be hereditary. Um, and I, I, I would consider an alternate theory that she could s simply just scare Brianna not to go close to the window if that was she was afraid of seeing her. So, but boy, we're getting into like, you know, theories without, you know, a lot of real uh, hard indications that that was true. Okay. Uh, doctor, I just have one more question for you. You, I noticed on your CV, you're a child neuropsychologist as well, right? I do child neuropsych, correct. What would the mental and emotional effect on a five-year-old be if they were isolated from the entire world, taken out of school, and locked in an apartment with nothing more than dull hands to sip? 
well, I'm not sure if I'm agreeing to the whole predicate is that she had a, nothing but dough cans, but the effects of deprivation socially uh, and being isolated can be quite significant. Um, children can deteriorate, children can develop eating disorders, so children can actually stop eating uh, if they're socially deprived. Uh, we see that in children who have attachment disorders or trauma. Um, so um, it, 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 they can become depressed. Um, so a lot of negative emotional as well as physical consequences could occur because of that. Yes, that could occur. Uh, do you think that Ms. Williams understood or appreciated the significance of not socializing with Taylor throughout the period of time after pulling her out or even mm -hmm. before uh, childhood? I, I think her own social anxiety, uh, fear and avoidance of other people caused her to over-identify with Taylor's wish to avoid school, which didn't sound like it was that much fun for her. Uh, and as we know, uh, the best cure for school avoidance, I used to have a national expert on school avoidance that worked for me uh, once upon a time, the best cure for school avoidance is to go to, to, go to school. You only reinforce the anxiety by keeping, uh, and just like a lot of anxiety disorders, the more avoidance that you do, the less prepared you are to face your fears. And story about getting back on the horse. So she identified with Taylor's, probably t identified with, with Taylor's not being psychologically, emotionally, anxiety ready to cope with the challenges of school. And she, you know, made a, made a great error, I think, in, in terms of keeping her home. It probably reinforced that. And her own paranoia, the ideas of protecting Taylor uh, probably also fed into that. And the state asked you about the role of a parent versus the, the role of a, a daughter or a child. Um, do you think that uh, the issues that Ms. Williams was going through as a child, uh, essentially why she's keeping her home, was almost allowing her daughter to make her own rules as, as if she shouldn't have allowed her to say, I want to stay home. Or I don't feel like uh, I feel like I'm being bullied, or I feel like there's problems, and so she allowed her to make those decisions when she shouldn't have as a parent. I don't think she has good insight into that. Certainly not something she told me. But as I conceptualize the case, I, that would make an awful lot of sense, and I believe that probably is true. Um, and so as Taylor would get older, she would have more wants and needs. And Well, you know, as a child, you know, at her age, Taylor expressed some of her wants and needs. She definitely wanted pizza uh, and, and definitely had her, her food preferences and would have little temper tantrums if she didn't get what she wanted sometimes. So Taylor could express in a very primitive way and basic ways, you know, some needs. Um, you know, I, I don't know really the extent of Taylor's speech and language uh, problems, but it would not be unusual. And if you kind of think about Brianna's own difficulties in communicating emotional types of things, um, I, I probably suspect that Taylor would be better at communicating what she wants as opposed to how she feels. And the older she gets, the more she could communicate. I'm sorry? The older Taylor was getting, the more she could communicate those things. Uh, 
Yeah, you would suspect that would be the case. I'm just going into the, the question that they asked you. She provided child care. She was doing everything in the beginning when she was younger. But then as she moved to Jacksonville, there's this change. And all of a sudden now she's bringing a kid at home. Although there were changes in how other people saw her, could that also have been a change in the age of the person that she's Yeah, I, po possibly so. I mean, you know, there seems to be indications in the text that after deployment that, uh, and in Jacksonville that some of Taylor's behaviors were, were more difficult to manage in terms of whether it was the toileting or whether it was putting stuff under the bed or kind of just being a little bit defiant. Uh, so I think certainly Taylor was, would be more forceful, I guess, in that sense. And of relevance is, Brianna's has a very strong need to please and maybe avoid conflict. You know, that's evident in her own BDSM uh, kind of involvement. Um, she's involved in kind of, uh, I'm not that familiar with it, uh, but sort of extreme submission where she actually kind of felt like people were not allowing her to be submissive enough. So this whole dynamic to sort of giving up your will to somebody else may play a role, you know, in, in some of the uh, dynamics with Taylor. And again, it wouldn't be a appropriate parenting role, but uh, does it make sense in terms of psychological makeup and factors that may have contributed to all this? You know, I, I think that that, you know, makes, makes some sense. There was some discussion about hearing voices and seeing visions that Ms. Williams articulated. Uh, I believe that was when she was up late and on uh, deployment. Like she was hearing things that she wasn't sure if they were true or they were real. And I believe you were asked about that um, on, on cross-examination. But that wasn't something that she was telling you was a uh, psychological issue that she was suffering in jail or, or recently. Was that? No. No, the, the, that was that was related to sleep deprivation, and all of us, if we're not sleep deprived enough, are going to start to um, have a few springs come loose. Um, so, you know, isolated in that sense, you know, it may be of limited significance. Although, when you put people under stress, if you have underlying psychotic tendencies, someone who has underlying psychotic tendencies are, are more likely to show psychotic symptoms. Uh, of somewhat relevance to that was the only other time she reported having a hallucination was that was she, when she was on Lexapro um, after the overdose uh, attempt, uh, she experienced a hallucination. Again, just a one-time thing, no indication that she's schizophrenic. But we also know that some of the antidepressants uh, can um, exacerbate or produce symptoms of bipolar disorder or psychosis in people that are prone to that. And unfortunately, sometimes they get misdiagnosed as having the disorder when it's just a medication reaction. But a lot of times when I do psychological testing and, and, and profiling uh, and recommendations to psychiatrists about medications, if I have suspicions that someone has some underlying psychotic tendencies, I will warn them to be particularly careful about antidepressants and antidepressants particularly who tend to be more activating. So it plays a part in, you know, a little bit of cumulative data uh, in terms of some of the underlying tendencies toward losing touch with reality. But, but that doesn't overlap with malingering. I mean, you typically hear that uh, defendants that are trying to feign psychotic symptoms are supposed to hear voices or start to see things. This isn't no, she, she more or less tended to, to want to present well and, you know, uh, um, yeah, she sort of, I don't think in any way she wanted, uh, and again, the psychological testing and profiles suggest, no, that she, she certainly didn't want people to believe that she was psychotic. The other question you were asked was Taylor's about picking out a daycare and keeping her home was so she could be able to eat. Uh, that, that was one of the examples she gave as to a reason why she came out. 
Yeah, I, I don't think Brianna wanted to keep her at home so she could eat whenever she wanted. I think Taylor wanted to be at home so she could eat whenever she wanted. Um, and so uh, it was more, and she didn't like school because she couldn't do that. So it was more related to the school avoidance and why she didn't want to go to school and why she wanted to stay home. And so the issue that Ms. Williams had with keeping her home was so that Taylor wasn't being uh, potentially abused or the issue that she suffered as a child and hearing that there was a fight over toys or um, she wasn't comfortable there. Those were her own issues that she had reasons in her own mind to keep her home. Yeah, I think she over-identified with the child and she wasn't really taking you know, the grown up in the room, you know, you got to go to school kind of thing because that's important. You have to sort of deal with distress. And, you know, her own anxiety created avoidance. She kind of overcomes stuff and, and in fact, overcompensated for it. So, um, you know, but anxiety creates avoidance and distress. And Taylor was anxious. And Brianna certainly knows what that feels like. And she's empathizing rather than playing the adult role and allowing her to withdraw rather than to sort of face the challenges uh, of like early school. And there was a, a, a question about the, how is this the truth. You're not saying that um, what was told to you, you can tell is the truth about Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm I'm reporting her report of that and and kind of my view of that, how it fits with her psychologically. I mean, I, obviously, I wasn't a witness. Right. And the, there was a characterization of dumping the body, uh, taking the body up to Alabama and dumping the body. Did did Miss Williams characterize it as dumping the body, or was she trying to do something different? She was she was trying she her. Uh, her, her report is that she, you know, wanted to bury her next to the grandfather. That's why she traveled all the way to Alabama. Um, certainly a lot more convenient places, uh, but she, that was her initial goal. And the idea was to bury her and shoot herself, you know. And she actually left the body, um, sorry, she, she drove up there. She, 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 mentioned, she mentioned another little detail that I didn't mention earlier, but she mentioned she tried to mark it to go back because she wanted to go back. So I think when she left the body there, um, you know, she, I think her intent was to go back. And again, she probably didn't, she didn't do a good job about locating and, and finding where to go back to. But yes, and I, I do understand that she went back up there um, at some point in time. I don't know. And it was after that attempt to go and locate the body of where she left it that she came home and then called the end over. I believe at some point, I, I, I believe there was a second trip from what she described. I don't know if that actually fits with the, uh, with the, with the, with the evidence in terms of her travel logs. Uh, my mind's starting to get a little bit <laughs> fuzzy <laughs> with fatigue here. I appreciate that. Um, so let's go back to the very first one. There was a question asked about when you testify to both the state and the defense in criminal proceedings. Yeah. You indicated that you do and also court appointed. Could you give me a breakdown roughly of what you estimate the yeah. percentage for state, yeah. defense, and court would be? Okay. Uh, I think probably the majority of cases have been called on have been for defense. Is um, that percentage that you could estimate? I would say, I would, I'd probably say 75%. Um, maybe court appointed and maybe 
10 and maybe prosecution, the rest. So approximately 15% state? Roughly. Correct. I don't get very, I haven't been called often by the state. I appreciate uh, it. Got it called in sort of a major case in the past. Uh, In, uh, well, certainly the psychological testing is empirically verifiable. We believe this is reliability and validity. We know about validity scales. We know the association between the scales and diagnostic criteria and so forth. Um, is there a term, is there a portion of your discipline that factors into your judgment um, that is art? Well, uh, where you could get differing opinions from differing experts correct. reviewing the same yeah. quantifiable data. So that's, it's a fair question. Um, again, I mentioned the test as being kind of uh, more empirical number oriented. I tend to be a mathematician, so I weigh that rather heavily. Um, diagnoses themselves have scientific reliability and validity. So, you know, we go through, as I said, multiple versions of our diagnostic manual over the many years that I've practiced. And we establish criteria which um, psychologists, psychiatrists can agree on in terms of whether a diagnosis is present or not. And there's objective criteria in terms of whether a symptom is there or not. Now, some of the data that plays in are observational things like affect or patient report. But the criteria themselves and the process of diagnoses and making predictions or prescribing medications is certainly part of medical science, psychological science, and so forth. Um, clinical intuition plays a part, right? That's what I want and, to you know, clinical, clinical, clinical intuition is, uh, you know, based on a, a doctor's or, or psychologist's experience base to some degree, and, and you know, that can vary. Uh, you know, my process is one of using your, clini your clinical intuition to test out hypotheses. So some people do testing. The test says this, so that this must be it. Uh, I look at testing as being uh, a way to prove or disprove what your clinical intuitions are, your observations are, and the history are, and you kind of look at the test results to see what's consistent with it, and were there any surprises in there that you didn't look at, and then what you didn't consider. So that becomes part of a diagnostic process and conceptualization. So my, narrow, my narrow question is, and I appreciate the detail, my narrow question is though, whether or not in reaching a diagnosis there's a part that's empirically verifiable. There's a part that's not empirically verifiable. They're both combined in the process of analysis by the expert in order to render the judgment. Okay, I, I think I understand. And, I, I, and as I mentioned, there are observations that you make or that you're interpreting the observation, such as, let's say, flat affect. Um, and one could say, well, that's just your observation. However, we could take physiological measures and have five people rate a face and say whether that's affective or not. Um, so as we're doing that clinically, we're not necessarily putting all our observations into a computer and saying, did it match or not? So there's some subjective clinical judgment in, in your observations. And when we come with clinical symptoms, we're relying on the patient's report, which obviously could be biased, um, but that also can have empirical basis based on medical records or history or collateral information. So, you know, there's a continuum, is the best I can describe it. I guess what I'm asking is whether or not two experts who have the same data available, both empirically based and observation based, could reach different conclusions regarding the diagnosis and be within the realm of, of, of a reasonable opinion. Uh, like I said, if someone was going to argue about schizoaffective disorder, I wouldn't have a strong difference of an opinion. I would say that some of that's present. And then we would get into the details of which particular symptom are we agreeing that you're not. 
So obviously experts can disagree, uh, but when we're relying on DSM-5 or 5R, we're trying to deal with a set of diagnostic entities that have been studied to ensure that people can diagnose that reliably. Otherwise, our whole science is useless and prescribing medication is useless. <laughs> have, have you ever testified in a case, either civil or criminal, where an expert has been called who reached a different conclusion than you, who reviewed the exact same empirical data and uh, observational data? C certainly in forensic, clinical, and criminal, experts can really reach different conclusions. It would be inappropriate for someone to hire someone for the purpose of uh, achieving a conclusion. Our job is to be objective. Uh, and yes, I've had situations where there have been big differences of opinion, but also a lot of cases where there's been more agreement than disagreement, and some of the disagreements are more subtle. So it varies. Uh, to the extent it varies, what is, I assume, this is what I'm trying to find out, what I assume is that the, the variation occurs in the subjective judgments of the evaluator, not the objective empirical findings of the test. Well, yes, you, you, let's say you were, you were talking about schizoaffective disorder, which is one of the things I considered. We could have a disagreement about um, whether it was or would not persistent across different um, situations, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you did, if one expert thought it was across all situations uh, and the other one didn't, then you'd have a, you wouldn't, one would diagnose that and one wouldn't. Speaking of the DSM, could you tell me what that is specifically? Uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual is a manual per, uh, published by the American Psychiatric Association. I kind of go back to all the way to DSM 2 and 3 uh, because I've been doing this for a long time. We're now up to DSM-5 TR. Uh, it's essentially a compendium of different diagnoses in intelligence, childhood psychiatric disorders, dementia, uh, sleep disorders, or whatever it is, that specifies the diagnostic criteria uh, and which are used for clinical decision-making uh, as well as research. Are those in your field permitted that there are differences when you phrase that. Is it, is there, can you tell me, I'll ask an open question, why is it that there are different versions of the DSM and that they have progressed all the way to DSM-5? Well, wise people know what they don't know, so we don't know everything all the time. So, you know, science and learning is evolving. Um, other things change because of social political things. So uh, we all had diagnoses of alcohol dependence and alcohol abuse in the past. We cured those miraculously in DSM-5. It's now called alcohol use disorder because it's less stigmatizing. So diagnoses uh, evolve and, and we get into more bizarre things like when they get into DSM-5, they didn't want to add more diagnoses so they wanted to take some out so they could have more sleep disorders. Do you anticipate uh, additional progress so that there will be other DSM Oh, interestingly enough, they said that they, they were doing DSMs by Roman numerals and they switched to, uh, 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 what's the other system other than Roman is the, uh, I'm rather lost. Anyhow, with, with like five, uh, instead of not a Roman, Roman numeral, because they were tired of revising it. And they originally said that they weren't going to have more sixes and sevens. They were just going to do updates. So we're actually now on DSM-5 TR, which is a revision of DSM-5. Does someone practicing in your field have the right to say, I prefer DSM-2 over, over DSM-5, and I'm going to use that as a basis for my judgment? Um, yes and no. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not mandated by law, and uh, certainly researchers may defer to what they think is a better defined uh, entity under one versus the other. So. Uh, DSM-5 is not a Bible. I have some things that I think they did well in the revision. They didn't include as much psychologist input in the revision. So there's a few things that mm, I, I kind of have quibbles with. The alcohol thing is an example. 
most alcohol researchers, which I've done quite a bit of in the past, uh, and I do uh, assessments, uh, and most addiction professionals draw a big distinction between dependence and abuse. So that's a good example of where there's a big part of the profession that kind of like disagrees with that in terms of research and conceptualization, but it's more politically palatable. So is a practitioner allowed then to, to prefer portions of the DSM, the DSM over another and uh, render opinions consistent with the one that they find hmm. most appropriate? Well, the, the, the advantage of DSM-5s or ICD-9, which is the international classification, are is it creates a common set of criteria for which you could do research and prove or disprove and test theories. Um, so uh, I think the important thing is to articulate what rules you're playing by. Are you using DSM-5 criteria, ICD-9, or if you stray from that, do you have uh, a reason why you're straying for that? In DSM-5, there's a whole section on conditions requiring further study. They're not official diagnoses, but they're things that are kind of in transition that we may be considering. So I, I think, you know, it's not like you're going to be kicked out of the profession if you kind of like say, you know, this particular diagnostic syndrome is more similar to what we've, you know, historically think of as, um, you know, psychogenic fugue or something else that may or may not be in that because I think it's descriptive and you're, you know, sort of calling what system you're trying to use or what criteria you're trying to use. Help me understand, did, did you say that there was no diagnosis, in your phrase, that you did not render a diagnosis consistent with the DSM? No, no, the diagnosis that I did were DSM-5 TR diagnoses. All right, forgive me for misunderstanding. And what specifically were the diagnoses you did? find the end of this report. Uh, here we go. Uh, my DSM-5 TR diagnostic impressions were of persistent depressive disorder with anxious distress, mild, early onset, with intermittent major depressive episodes, with a current episode severe, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, an unspecified eating or feeding disorder, other trauma or stressor related disorder, the depersonalization, derealization disorder that we discussed, schizoid, paranoid, and avoidant personality features, an alcohol use disorder and sustained remission. She had abused alcohol in high school and had blackouts and so forth, but while most people go on to college and continue that alcohol career, she was socially anxious around her college people, and that was pretty much the end of her alcohol use disorder. She has a history of right knee. Well, the, the other things are medical ones, so they're not DSM-5 uh, issues, and those are just based on the records. The, the report you prepared that I've not had a chance to look at it actually cite the section of the DSM you rely on. Um, no, I didn't cite the particular sections, but they would be listed and, you know, but they have a section with diagnostic criteria. I did not diagnose that. It was a consideration. So I kind of didn't think she met the full criteria for that. I heard you reference all of the others, but I didn't get the link between the diagnosis in relation to the DSM, so I appreciate you saying that. Uh, on the test for malingering, um, the validity, as I heard your testimony, is to determine whether there is gross malingering. Is that correct? Uh, it's, it's essentially the same definition. So malingering, by definition, is gross exaggeration. So... Um, the test of malingering is for gross exaggeration, not for gross malingering, which would be gross exaggeration of gross exaggeration, right. if the semantics. Can you tell me what the cutoff is and what she scored? Um, I could. Uh, I'd have to go back to um, find that particular test. And, and there, re there are really multiple indices of that. So...
just going to have to take a page at a time or I'm just going to be fumbling around. Unfortunately, I didn't find it on my first go through there. I'm having a, I'm having a hard time finding it. I don't know who went to it. Okay. Behavioral determinism, vaguely. I'm not a big behaviorist. <laughs> well, that was the next question I was going to ask, is whether or not you believe that all behavior is accounted for exclusively by genetics uh, or by environment or a combination of the two. I, I, I believe that be, my good old buddy Freud, I'm not that old, said behavior is multiply determined. Behavior is a consequence of genetics, genetic risk factors, supposed to behavior related to illnesses and so forth by environment, by learning, uh, you know, um, so it's multifactorial. Is there anything beyond genetics and environment that you believe impacts behavior? I'll, I'll ask it uh, differently. I wrote it differently. I just listened to the opinion from the gentleman. Um, uh, is there, is, is all behavior explainable by psychological Well, psycholo psychological is a broad term. Uh, by, by, by definition, psychology is the study of behavior, so uh, I think it's a circular kind of argument. Uh, all behavior then is explainable by genetics and environment or some combination of the two? I, I think behavior is explained by genetics, environment, trauma, personality, uh, by rewards, consequences, um, you know, so threat. <laughs> situation. Is there any behavior that is not determined and only you say is that? Can anyone ever act contrary to the psychological diagnoses they've been given? Sure. Okay. Anything further for the state? I'm alert for the defense. No, Your Honor. Anything further for the defense? Not even helpful. Thank you. Uh, we're in recess for lunch. Thank you.
score on the uh, Sims is the total score. Um, the more items and scales you have, the more reliable usually your numbers are, and reliability poses an upper limit to validity. In her case, the, she got a total raw score of six, and the cutoff was greater or equal to 14. And there are subscale scores for neurological impairment, affective disorder, psychosis, low intelligence, and amnesia, all of which also were below the cutoff scale. The closest one, kind of follow up on your question, was the affective scale. She got a score of five on that. Uh, normally greater than five would be considered to be indicative of malingering. And your sensitivity and specificity, I kind of looked that up during lunch as well, was a 0.90. So uh, once you stray from greater than five, you're going to get classification rates that are less than 90% accurate, as long as you stick with the greater than five. Normally, when you interpret that test, if you have scores that are above the cutoff, you would examine the individual items to minimize false positives. So, for example, on the affective scale in her case, I kind of looked at that during lunch as well, there are a couple of items like I, I'm depressed most of the time and I have trouble sleeping. Well, we know that's accurate both from her, uh, uh, from, the, from the evaluation and also from the jail records in which there's a lot of complaints about sleep difficulties and her history of taking sleep medication. So even if she scored over five, you'd kind of need to look at those items and kind of, you know, sort of use your clinical judgment about that. The SIM shouldn't be used by itself. It's usually used with other tests. Um, and in uh, anticipation of your other uh, question about standard errors of measurement, um, the cutoffs for a lot of the other scales are greater than two or greater than one. Um, it's not a continuous variable, so you wouldn't really calculate means and standard deviations to create a standard error of measurement. It's more of an ordinal classification kind of error rate that you would calculate for the sensitivity and specificity that I kind of described earlier. On the MMPI, we have T-scores because we have a lot more items, and you would need to score a lot more items to be determined to be exaggerating or endorsing unusual items or minimizing. And taking this, in, in addition to the fact that she was defensive and tended to have a profile of minimizing things, uh, you know, clinically you would run a higher risk that she had more psychopathology and more severe symptoms than she was reporting rather than the other way around if there was going to be a misinterpretation of the results. Are your findings and corresponding diagnoses descriptive or predictive in both? Uh, we engage in diagnoses because, and we create a diagnostic system in order to treat people, so there is some prediction to that, uh, predictability to that. I certainly, for example, scale eight on the MMPI, which is the schizophrenia scale, that was her highest scale. It tends to be very stable over time, and it tends to be associated with chronic maladjustment interpersonally, uh, and kind of correlates with emotional alienation. So the problems she's had, if they go untreated, will remain, you anticipate them to remain stable or constant? Um, could be constant, they could get worse under stress. Um, you know, again, I'm concerned that she has persistent suicidal ideation, though not active in terms of planning to do anything now. You know, I, she kind of feels like there's not a lot of reason to live without Taylor. Um, and um, given the seriousness of her suicidal attempt, someone who makes such an attempt and with a history of, would have a really elevated risk for suicide lasting out to five years or so. And we'd normally want to monitor those people carefully. How about her relationship to others, excluding? Yes, the scale, scale eight and the introversion scale both have high consistency over time, and, and she scores on both of those, and as well as emotional alienation. And I would probably predict she would remain somewhat detached and seem odd or weird to some people uh, for the foreseeable future. By definition, some of the personality disorders and features are things that we expect to be stable over time. Um, so those things are, are present. 
She has a major depressive disorder recurrent by definition. Usually by the time you get out after two or three depressive episodes, the likelihood of having more in your lifetime is very high. Psychiatrists will typically keep you on antidepressant medication for the foreseeable future once you've had your second or third episode. exercise her right to out you. She does not intend to testify. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, Ms. Williams, would you stand for me so we can see each other clearly? Just raise your right hand for me if you would, please. You saw me swear the evidence you're about to give this cause to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you out. Yes, Go ahead and put your hand up. Make yourself as comfortable as you can. Um, I'm sure Mr. Beard has told me you have the right to testify uh, at your sentencing hearing, and, and I'm certainly prepared to hear your testimony. You also have a right not to testify if that's your choice. Uh, your lawyer has indicated that you want to allocute, which means you're going to read a written statement that I'll consider, and I'm certainly prepared to do that. You have a right to allocute under the statute. Uh, you have an applicable rules and case law. You have a right uh, to testify if you choose to testify. Of course, if you testify, you'll subject yourself to cross-examination by a trained prosecutor. Has that gone into your decision not to testify? In other words, do you want to allocute rather than testify because you believe that to be in your best interest? Yes, sir. All right. Do you need any additional time to think about your options or discuss your options with your lawyer? No, sir. Uh, and you want to have Mr. Beard read something into the record for or correct that, uh, Mr. Beard's mitigation specialist read something into the record for you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you'd rather have her do it than you? Uh, for what reason? It's your right, that's why I'm asking. Someone else is going to actually stand in your shoes and read it rather than you. I'm asking you why it is you don't want to read your own statement. I'm nervous and I'm scared. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm nervous and I'm scared. All right. State, do you have any objection? There's no objection, but I think the law is clear that this could not be the basis of this allocution for any type of argument on downward departure. I understand that as well, um, and I appreciate the let me rephrase that. I appreciate the reminder, Mr. Hudson. Yes, I truly do. Thank you. Um, and I understand as well that it's an unsworn statement, and it's not subject to cross-examination. So with that said, of course, that those are the options that you have. Um, do you choose to have someone else read your statement for you? I'm certainly prepared to do that if that's what you want. Okay. Please have a seat for me. Thank you. Mr. Beard. Just so the record's clear, if you could identify yourself, please. My name is Erica Johnson. I'm the mitigation specialist at the Public Defender's Office. Whenever you're ready, Ms. Johnson. Okay. I knew what I did was wrong. I 
failed as a mother, a protector, and as a decent human being. I didn't immediately call the police, and when I finally called, I lied and lied some more, and I didn't take advantage of any timely opportunity to right my wrongs. I apologize to everyone affected by this tragedy. I'm tormented and punished every day since losing my baby. I tried to kill myself to escape it all. However, I'm not asking for any sympathy. I deserve everything I've received over the past approximately three years, externally and internally. I lost the most important person in my life, and without her, I lost myself. I accept full responsibility for everything. I voluntarily pled up to murder. I blame no one but myself. Thank you. Mr. Beery, any additional evidence or, or uh, witness report concerned? Thank you so much. Have a seat, please. Uh, I'll go ahead and hear from the attorneys now. I'll look for the state first and defense. The state will have a brief response. November 6, 2019. This defendant was presented with multiple opportunities to tell the truth. 13 minutes on a 911 call, at least 30 minutes with Officer Livingston, an hour with Detective Whitaker, close to 12 hours in an interview room. Five days, three states, hundreds of officers, miles of land searched day in and day out, all coming to a close because Captain Roberts followed his nose in the pitch black on his hands and knees, scouring every piece of earth on Landfill Road. Not knowing at the time that just eight days prior, this defendant discarded her daughter like a piece of trash on the side of the road. Her tiny body in a BU t-shirt wrapped in a filthy shower curtain, like nothing more than trash. Unfortunately for this defendant, that 911 call reporting five-year-old Taylor Williams missing triggered an unending, all hands on deck, no stone left unturned investigation. One which easily proved each word that she told investigators to be untruthful. One which produced a plethora of evidence to again today provide this court more evidence to prove this new story to be a lie. Dr. Gordini's report was provided by the defense, and while it was supposed to be mitigation, it was nothing more than aggravation. He paints a picture of a woman riddled with anxiety and depression and paranoia, easily influenced by others. But that feels like a far cry from the valedictorian, the high-ranking military member with top-secret clearance. It seems like a far cry from the testimony that Your Honor heard of the individuals that she worked with. Ms. Frazier called her outstanding, nothing, and learned a lot from her. Chief Keyes acknowledged that the rank the defendant had achieved in her time in the military was quickly moving up. Michael Stratford spoke about the in-depth process that someone has to go through in order to get that top secret clearance. Now, the defense pointed out on, on cross that these people didn't truly know Brianna Williams, that she was somehow hiding all of this anxiety, this depression, and this paranoia from the people that she spent arguably the majority of her time with, eight to 12 hours a day. Um, Dr. Bordini's report details what the state would categorize as exaggerations. But let's talk about the evidence that the court heard. The first thing that the court saw was that Ivy Street house, a staged house. This defendant quickly moved in there after she had already gotten rid of Taylor's body. She strategically placed Taylor's bed in that empty room with the little chair, a box of crackers on the bed, and the little shoes next to it. And in the kitchen, next to that tiny backpack, a box of oatmeal. As I pointed out during Dr. Bordini's testimony, these things are telling. Your Honor heard the testimony about Dr. Walsh Haney's findings that what she observed on the skeletal remains, the 10% that could be found, was that this child was potentially malnourished. The, the apartment. During the investigation,
investigation, investigators were led to that apartment. And as I stated before, those pictures, they don't just speak words. Those pictures, you can smell them. You can feel them. You can feel what Taylor Williams lived through for the last seven months of her life. And that car. You heard testimony that there was a smell of decomp coming from that car. And why would that be? Because that's how this defendant transported that body from Jacksonville, Florida to Alabama, where she threw her on the side of the road. But most importantly, the evidence that this court heard laying out the manipulation that Brianna Williams went through, the steps that she took to cover her tracks, to paint a picture for investigators, because she knew that they would do certain things. That cell site data. Your Honor saw that there were multiple tricks taken. The first map that Your Honor saw shows that she never left the state of Florida. It disproved her story that she was going back and forth between Jacksonville and Alabama. But what she did do once she started going to Alabama is she took three trips. The first being on Halloween. She had to take that trip because that's what she told investigators. I went up there to pick up my daughter. And you see that she drives through Tuscaloosa where her mother was living and then back to Florida. She took steps to lay out what could provide evidence to support her lies. But unfortunately for her, what she didn't know is that the car that she was traveling in would ultimately lead investigators directly to where she put Taylor's body. Now, in that report, she talks about how she laid Taylor's body on the side of the road and she went back. But what you heard Detective Brooks testify to is that that body was left there on trip number three. She never returned. Just another thing that was untruthful coming from this defendant. Again, the recovery of the bones. Your Honor heard the testimony related to Dr. Walsh Haney's findings, that Krugera orbitalia and the linear enamel hypoplasia, both indicative of potential malnourishment. Your Honor saw in the um, apartment, and we introduced this camp with a tiny little opening at the top, just enough for her to sit. As she sat in that apartment for hours on end, day in and day out. Again, this defendant planning, knowing what she's going to tell the police, she does things like purchase movie tickets after she's already discarded her child's body on the road, another form of manipulation. The Craigslist ads, she strategically, right before calling the police to report Taylor missing, she goes on and asks for child care, knowing that that child is no longer with us. All of these things, one on top of the other, so that she could say, look, I'm telling the truth to the police. But what she didn't anticipate is that the state would have the opportunity to go through each and every text message to each person that she sent. And those text messages are so telling. Those text messages paint a picture of a person who is obsessed with food, obsessed with body image. Those text messages paint a picture of someone who took that obsession with food and transferred it to her daughter. In Dr. Gordini's report, there's talk of the reason she took her out of school was bullying, but also it's mentioned specifically that Taylor wanted to eat and she didn't like the timetable at school. She was much happier at home, where she could do what she wanted and eat when she, whatever she wanted, a five-year-old. And this defendant took her out of school and left her home alone to fend for herself. And Your Honor saw in those text messages that this defendant isn't just going to work and coming home. She's going to work, and then she's caring about her social life. She's going and hanging out with men until 11 o'clock at night. And where is Taylor? She's left in that apartment all by herself, a five-year-old. Your Honor heard the testimony of the neighbors, Carlos Johnson and Pauletta Sweeney. Now, there was a big deal made about April 17th, but what can't be disputed is what Carlos Johnson describes as accurate to a T, where he describes seeing Taylor, the boxes that he saw stacked behind the door. We know all of that to be true because we have pictures of it dating all the way back till June. It's worth noting
noting that when Taylor would come out of that apartment, hugged up on her dolly, probably the only friend that she had to keep her company while she's locked in this apartment, the words that she says to Carlos Johnson is, I'm looking for my mommy. I'm looking for my mommy. Before she's ushered back inside by herself to wait for her mom to return home only to do it all again the next day. Dr. Bordini talked about um, how the defendant hid Taylor away. And that makes sense. He called it speculation, but it makes sense with the evidence. After Pauletta Sweeney makes this offer to babysit, suddenly Carlos Johnson isn't seeing Taylor in that window anymore. And while it's speculation, it certainly makes sense with what the evidence shows that she was locked in that closet. The carpet stained with feces, the smell of urine overpowering as detectives went through the apartment. Confined day in and day out. A mother is supposed to be mama bear. A mother is supposed to be the one who provides nourishment, love, safety, and security to a child. Sadly for Taylor Rose, her mother had a change of heart. Taylor became too much, acting out, wetting the bed, in need of extra attention, interfering with her social life, interfering with her ability to move up and work, wanting more food than what the defendant felt she should have. So she withdrew her from the world, literally and figuratively. From late April to late October, seven months, Taylor Rose was left home for spans of eight hours during the day, left home alone in the dark, sometimes until midnight, and even overnight, Your Honor saw that text message where at 6.30 p.m. she's in Fort Pierce, and where is Taylor? While the state doesn't have direct evidence, the evidence put forward leads one to believe that she even locked Taylor in that closet. Unfortunately, we'll never know exactly how she died because the defendant let her body decompose before she discarded her like a piece of trash. Your Honor is left to guess as to what happened based on those pictures, based on the closet door that somehow has Taylor's blood, not just anywhere, but at the top and the bottom. We'll never know exactly what happened. This court's left only with the multiple stories that she's told, both to detectives and now to Dr. Bordini. And the court has all of this evidence. With every text message, with every ping of that cell phone, with every trek that she drove, it tears and rips apart at her stories, making them not factual. We are asking that this court sentence Brianna Williams in conformity with the fate that she bestowed upon Taylor Williams. We're asking that this court confine her for life imprisonment. Thank you, State Defense. Mr. Beard. Thank you. is huge with the significance of the evidence that's presented, but also the lack of the evidence that's presented. There is complete speculation, and we're not here for a trial. We're here for a determination of a sentence. And the arguments of sipping through a can of the pineapple juice being locked in the closet without any evidence that there was a lock ever on the closet 
is not worth going into at the moment. But the evidence that they were relying on, specifically Carlos Johnson, that man got on the stand and said the day that he remembers was his mother's birthday. And in the middle of that call wishing his mother a happy birthday, she was alone in the parking lot. And he admitted, to his credit, that they didn't call the police until after the news reports were out and they reflected back. Dr. Bordini got up and <coughs> talked about a doll versus the stuffed animal. And he talked about Ms. Williams taking offense that she was not outside. She would not have done that. She would not have gone outside. And it was odd to hear that type of frustration or issue with that type of scenario. But until the daycare records were looked at, it matched. She was in daycare. But the state's reliance on everything else that Carlos Johnson says it is hard to get over. And so if we take that away, it doesn't stop 8787 Southside Boulevard from being the photographs that Your Honor has. This staged house on 661 Ivy Street, the phone calls, the driving, all of the stuff that was done did not prohibit the investigation into the actual location of where Taylor's remains stayed and decomposed. That wasn't removed, that wasn't ripped out from the first discussion with the officers. Where did you stay? When did you move in? It was revealed that this apartment was there. She wasn't going to extreme lengths to send this whole investigation, the investigation started and it got out of control without being able to rein it back in. And it's hard to say that all of the investigation was not worthwhile. It, it's an amazing job that was done to be able to find the remains and go through all of the data to locate where the remains of tales were. However, if we look backwards from that point, there could have been months of cleanup. There could have been destruction of evidence. All of it could have been burned, systematically removed. None of that was done, yet there was decomposition that was there for weeks. If you're going to put that on Ms. Williams, that she is doing this in a right state of mind and that she didn't have any issues, it doesn't make sense with how the evidence sits. We talked to FDLE. They said that decom decomposition can test positive for the hematin test for blood. Well, what's in, in the closet? Where did we learn that the remains were? There, there's no disputing that there's decomposition in the house, there's decomposition in the car. But once that happens and you turn your back and leave it for a period of time, it doesn't get better. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to smell. There's only going to be more insect. And anybody walking into that scene is going to be floored. The first officer is going to that house, and the evidence technicians, they went through hundreds of items. And it's clear. There's photographs for your honor to look at. There's, there's one that we brought into evidence, and there's a photograph of Taylor taken by Ms. Williams, and you can see an outline of the computer where she had set up the desk. In the apartment where she was sitting on the floor in filth. This isn't a photograph of Ms. Williams taking it staged. She wouldn't have staged that type of photograph. It's a product of what we're trying to present to the court of mental health issues and not being able to realize the significance of what is going on. And it's a hard part from her neighborhood and from her schoolwork. 
that was the question I was asking every witness. Did they do anything or know her outside of her job? And there was not one person that was able to be presented, and there's not one person that we've been able to present that can say they knew her outside of work. It's a different dynamic when you're in a job, in a role. It's telling that her initial disclosure on 911 and when she walks out, the officer said she was dressed with her uniform tucked into her boots with her cap on and she was there in uniform. She put on this front and that role is able to be calm, but yet on the inside, you can see it boiling over as you watch the video with the shakes. She is visibly shaken. At that moment, the realization that not only you are telling the world that you made a mistake, the worst error of your life, your career is now going to be going into that direction. Everything she has worked for and done is lost. Ms. Williams presented the, the statement to Ms. Johnson and saying that she lost her daughter and her best friend. There are no other individuals that can be called that can say they were closer, which is sad. And this is all sad, because if the state decides to say, how could she be your best friend? How could she be your mother? That is a decision that nobody can make. That is the internal and that person's decision as to what they are doing and what they believe. Her belief may not be consistent with everybody else's belief on what she felt was close relationship because we talked about her history and her past. We learned that her mother didn't raise her. Her grandmother raised her. Her mother left when she was young and that she didn't know her father until she was 16. All of these things in her upbringing lead her to have attachment issues and not to understand what the true attachment is as a parental figure. There's no correlation to her service in the Navy. There's, there's no parental role in the Navy. There's individuals, you heard from Ms. Frazier, who said that she was the individual who was to take her on and she was her uh, sponsor. But Ms. Frazier never went to dinner with her, never did anything more than her sponsor in the Navy. They talked on the phone, but not a personal relationship outside of communication that was digital or over the phone. The trips to Alabama and Landfill Road and garbage You've heard from Dr. Bordini and in interviews with Ms. Williams that that is not the characterization that we would, we would make. It's an argument that the state is making, and it happens to be a county road, and nobody wants to refer to it as the county road that this took place on, because it fits the way they want this evidence to be viewed. And by leaving the remains on the side of the road, there's no good way to do that. There's no good ending to this situation. And by saying that it's just discarded is an internal understanding as to what she is doing. This court has the ability to make that decision and determine what you believe she was doing in that scenario. That was the purpose of Dr. Bordini's testimony. It doesn't go back to a lie detector test. He's not a human lie detector. But he was able to go through and determine that there was social anxiety, anxiety issues, agoraphobia, 
association issues. And all of those caused this break in these walls of the world. We've heard about Dr. Walsh Haney and uh, potential malnourishment. Unfortunately, it is a hard argument to make about the malnourishment because there's not a reflection of that from my client. There's no testimony to present to you on that subject. We have the Tango leaving daycare and then the remains found. The rest of that is subject to reading the tea leaves from all the records and whether or not someone could present evidence. Had Ms. Williams called 911 the day she found her daughter, a lot of those questions would have been answered. For the state's sake and for Ms. Williams' sake, neither one of them can go back to get those answers. On the trips and the map, just to go back to them just for a second, they all do go to the same general location. And for the state to say they can tell that she didn't go to a certain location by the cell phone mapping, I think is, is not accurate. I think that the location data is not as specific and the information they obtained for the car infotainment in Burla is more specific than what they received from the cell phone and the cell site data to be able to pinpoint the location. And that was used on the last, uh, that was the last piece of information that came in for them to find the remains. But the remainder of the searches were taking place from cell site data. We have a stage However you want to put it, it's a house that was rented months back. It was only used after all of this took place. It was not rented, purchased after the, with the intent, apologize, with the intent to defraud or to manipulate this investigation. It was done prior to that. The reason why I'm saying that is that Carlos Johnson and his fiance were trying to give a date range way, way early in this time frame. And then they started smelling, didn't see her. And that's the only indication that it was earlier. But yet the records that you've heard from JSO reviewing indicate that it was later that they believed that Taylor was deceased. It wasn't earlier. The planning is poor at best when we look at all of the records and Fandango and the movie tickets. That is, everything is after the fact. Everything is an excuse. Miss Williams is not making an excuse for her actions, which is different than the excuses that were sitting in the investigation. The amount of records that were obtained and reviewed in this case were voluminous to say the least. What you have before you is the slimmest version and the the, the, the most distilled portions of those records. We're still left with the question as to what sentence this court would impose. And the guidelines in this case account for the injury points, the death points, the crime, 
And that is what she has pled to. The deceit, lying to police officers, is not part of the murder charge. It is after for a consciousness of guilt type argument. And I would ask the court to consider it as that. I believe that this case has a mitigating circumstance under 921.0026 for the capacity of the defendant to appreciate the criminal nature of the conduct. But we're not asking this court to depart. We're asking this court to follow the guidelines and impose a 20.5 year sentence. Ms. Williams has told you that she's apologized for wasting everyone's time, wasting the resources. And we can't get those resources back. But the treatment and the lifelong torment that she will endure for losing her daughter will stay with her for as long as she's on this earth. If there was ever an opportunity as a first time offender to be given a chance of release to benefit the community, society, which she has proven she can do, that is what we're asking this court to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beard. I'll look to the state one last time. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Beard just said that the guidelines account for the crime charge and the death. But this court is given those guidelines as a baseline, and there is a maximum. And this court has the discretion to consider the evidence, the mountain of evidence and aggravation in this case in determining what sentence is appropriate. Mr. Beard talked about having remorse. She has remorse. She has remorse for the amount of time that was spent in this investigation. But what about remorse for taking her own daughter's life? Mr. Beard said she lost her daughter and her best friend, and that this occurred because of attachment issues. That's what we heard, attachment issues. She clearly knows the difference between right and wrong. And to say that she did all of this because of how she was raised, that report talks about how the people coming and going were going to work. She wasn't left alone in her own filth to fend for herself, like she did to her daughter. Ignoring the opportunity to have free daycare, ignoring her coworkers, saying, hey, I'll cover your last hour of your shift so you can go pick up your kid. She ignored every piece of help that was offered to her. Mr. Beard also said that talking about this Ivy Street house is reading into things. Well, the Ivy Street house is so important because of when it was obtained, in June of 2019. What else happens in June of 2019? An inspection on her apartment. That inspection photo that your honor saw, the piles of trash starting to build up, triggering in her head, not only have my neighbors seen my daughter outside and also alone in my apartment by herself, but now they're inspecting my apartment. She's got to get out. The Ivy Street house is a facade, and she carries that facade with her all the way up until she reports Taylor missing on November 6th. When she comes back from Alabama, she's texting her core group. Your honor has those text messages. She is texting all of them, telling everybody how unsafe the Ivy Street house is, how it's been burglarized. She's building all of this up. She's talking about, I have to get out of this lease. She's gonna go to legal on the base. This Ivy Street house is for a purpose, so that she can pretend like her daughter was taken out from the back door without her knowing. Mr. Beard talked about how 
malnourishment is a hard argument to make and that we're reading the tea leaves. Well, Your Honor, why are we all having to read the tea leaves in this courtroom today? Is it because the state of Florida and the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and the FBI and the SBI and every agency involved in this didn't do a good enough job? Certainly not. It's because this defendant left her daughter decaying in her apartment until she mustered up the courage to wrap her in a shower curtain, throw her in the trunk of her car, and drive her to Alabama to put her on the side of the road. And the state has characterized it as discarding her like a piece of trash, and we stand by that. Because as Your Honor saw in those photographs, that is what is alongside that. This isn't a place that you put something to come back to. You heard the testimony of Captain Roberts. It's so dark out there that he couldn't see his own hand in front of his face. She put her out there in hopes of no one ever finding her. She was going to tell JSO, my daughter went missing. I have no idea what happened. But unfortunately for her, they were smarter. And they started tracking and tracking and uncovering everything, every piece of evidence that she placed every text message to prove that it was a lie. Mr. Beer just talked about how everything is after the fact. Everything is not after the fact. She has carried this lie for months. She's lied to her neighbors who have asked where Taylor is. Oh, she's in Alabama. She's lied to her friends, to her coworkers, to her own family. In fact, Your Honor has a text message in there where her best friend, Dorielle Sims, as she's driving to go put her daughter on the side of the road, she sends a picture, a selfie of herself with an empty car seat in the back. More of that planning, more of that manipulation because she had to keep up the act. You have the text messages with Fred Baker where he's like, oh, your daughter's here? I thought she was in Alabama. No, she's always here. She's carried this lie for months. And I'll just touch briefly on pinpointing the location. Your Honor heard the testimony from Detective Brooks. The reason that we know exactly where she was dropped and exactly when she was dropped is because her vehicle told and there is only one time that that vehicle goes to that location. She wasn't coming back. She didn't hope that someone would find Taylor. She hoped no one would find Taylor. Your Honor, this defendant's actions are indicative of someone who is manipulative. They're indicative of someone who is highly intelligent. This defendant doesn't deserve the opportunity to go back out in the community. If this is how she treats her quote unquote best friend, she deserves to live like she treated her best friend. And the state believes that life imprisonment is the only appropriate outcome in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. The state and defense having made their arguments regarding sentencing the court will be in recess for an hour. There's some evidentiary exhibits I want to review. We'll be back on the record promptly at 4 o'clock. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. We're in recess. Thank you all.
uh, related to photographs to make sure that I've seen them all. Uh, and we'll talk about anything else that I need to review that I haven't seen so that I don't miss anything. And then I'll take the case under advisement until Tuesday. All right? So with that said, State, let's go ahead and start. And you can move through them. Uh, and I will tell you next when I'm done looking at whatever it is you're presenting. Your Honor, do I need to announce what photograph we're looking at? You do. So it would be, for example, 1A, and then you'll just move right on through whatever it is you've got to show me. Yes, Your Honor. May I be seated for this? You certainly may. Okay. Everybody can remain seated for the balance of the viewing. Um, State's Exhibit 1. I've seen it. Next. State's Exhibit 2. Next. 3. Next. 4. Next. 5. Next. 6. Next. 7. Next. 8. Next. 9. Next. 10. Next. 11. Next. 12. Next. 13. This may be the first item I didn't see during the course of the trial. I may be mistaken. I've seen it now. Next. 14. Next. 15. I've seen this at trial. Go ahead. 16. Next. 17. Next. 18. Next. 19. Next. 20. Next. 21. Next. 22. Next. 23. These are items I did not see at trial. Next. 24. Next. 25. Next. 26. Next. 27. Next. 28. Next. 29. Next. 30. Next. And again, many of these I saw as exhibits during the trial. Go ahead. 31. Next. 32. Next. 33. Next. 34. Next. 35. Next. 36. Next. 37. Next. 38. Next. 39. Next. 40. Next. 41. Next. 42. Next. 43. Next. 44. Next. 45. Next. 46. Next. 47. Next. 48. Next. 49. Next. 50. Next. 51. Next. 52. Next. 53. Next. 54. Next. 55. Next. 56. I think that, no, I did see that at trial. Uh, I've seen all the others at trial. I've seen 56. Next. 57. Next. 58. Next. 59. Next. 60. Next. 61. Next. 62. Next. 63. Next. 64. Next. 65. Next. 66. Next. 67. Next. 68. Next. 69. Next. 70. Next. 71. Next. 72. Next. 73. Next. 74. Next. 75. Next. 76. Next. 77. Next. 78. And again, uh, all the way up to 78. There may have been four or five items in those 78 that I did not see at trial. Everything else I've seen, but I'm just confirming that I've reviewed it. Go ahead. 78, 79 now. 79. Next. 80. Next. 81. Next. 82. Next. 83. Next. 84. Next. 80. 85. And the last five photographs I have not seen at trial, um, I've seen them now. Next. 86. Next. 87. Next. 88. Next. 89. Next. 90. Next. 91. Next. 92. Next. 93. Next. 94. Next. 90. That was it. Sorry. So 78 through 94 were photos of the crime scene. I saw all of those at trial. Um, give me one moment. The audio I listened to at trial as well as saw, so the audio video 
the maps, I want to make sure that I've reviewed everything. Uh, all of those were presented in your direct examination of witnesses, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. You have hard copies also? I do, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, the documentary exhibits, uh, beginning with the Navy leave request, uh, the Craigslist, I saw all of these documents as well during the course of the trial. Moving on to physical evidence, uh, I saw all of the physical evidence at trial. I saw all of the DNA evidence at trial. I saw excerpts from the text messages. Is there anything that the state is asking that I review that was particularly, let me rephrase, was not specifically discussed with witnesses? No, Your Honor. Is there anything the defense is asking me to review that was not specifically re discussed with witnesses? One second, Your Honor. All of the items, let me rephrase that. It appears that the items that are listed individually were specific text messages rather than the block of messages that may have been retrieved by the investigating officer. So it may be that they were all covered. I'll look to the state. Was there anything that you have listed that was not specifically covered by your witness? Your Honor, it might be best just to show you an example. So these are in groups yep. based on the person that was being texted with. So there are additional messages in each one of these packets. I got that impression from the exhibit when it was put on the screen for the witness. That's why I'm asking. So apparently there are other other issue, other messages in those long extended texts. Are you asking that I specifically review any of the other items other than those that you questioned the witnesses about? No, Your Honor. Is the defense asking that I do that? You take your time. Just look at the Moving on to the financial records and evidence, is there anything other than the purchase at issue that you want me to consider that's part of that financial record? No, Your Honor. All right, I've already seen it. Mr. Beard, anything? No. Okay. So I've got a pretty good idea of what remains, and it's essentially the deposition uh, and the psychologist's report. I'm afraid I won't be able to get to that this afternoon. Mr. Beard, let me look to you um, so that I'm clear. There were, I believe, four additional defense exhibits along with, I may be mistaken. How many defense exhibits do you have? I believe there's seven. All right. Um, the one you have is item one. Number two was the uh, military service history records. Um, and then there was transcripts from um, our high school. I have not seen any of those. And then it was the four, I'm not sure I displayed one of the photos in the argument. But so there was four additional photos. I saw them all when they were submitted for admission as an evidentiary exhibit, but I'll look at them again if you don't mind. Given the volume for me to review, um, there's no way that I can complete my review and do everyone justice by 
four o'clock. So uh, I'll stick with the proposal and pass the matter till Tuesday for sentencing. We'll wait for everybody to return. We'll put it all on the record. Thanks. Thank you. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. We're off the record. Get the four o'clock hour and.
We went back on the record, uh, so there wasn't much of a recess at all. I reviewed all of the photographs associated with both the states and the defendant's case. Uh, I went through all 127 items that the state had introduced and the seven items that the defense had introduced to make sure that there was nothing I had missed. Um, my intent in the recess was to read the report, which was not made available uh, actually probably yesterday, and I didn't realize that uh, I needed to read it prior to today. Um, the bottom line is uh, I pulled Defendant's Exhibit 1, which is the psychological report, and then realized that there was also Defendant's Exhibit 2, which was a mitigation packet that includes transcripts uh, and a number of other items, a significant number of items. And then there was Defendant's Exhibit 3, which was her entire uh, military history, which had been submitted for my consideration. Uh, correct that with, in reverse order. The exhibit two was uh, military records and three was the transcripts. And then there was the deposition of a, an expert who prepared the report on osteological examination. So I asked Mr. Beard uh, what his intent was and he asked that I read it in its entirety because that was why he said the state could essentially either call a witness by Zoom or not call a witness at all and have me rely on the report with the understanding that I would read the deposition transcript that had not been read. I want to do justice by both parties, of course, which means I intend to read every word of all of the exhibits just as I've reviewed all of the photographs. I reviewed with the lawyers the portions of the financial exhibit as well as the text message exhibit to make sure there was nothing that I had missed. These are the last remaining items. I could not review them in sufficient detail with the time I gave myself, which means that I unfortunately need to pass the case. I conferred with counsel and it will be passed until Tuesday, September 20th at one o'clock back here in Courtland 508. At that time, I, have, I will have finished my review of the evidentiary exhibits, finished my review of the law, and it's my intent to pronounce sentence at that time. Is there anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, You've all been helpful. Thank you so much. Court's adjourned for the day. Thank you. Yes.